this is a lot of the press are using iPhones now. Yeah, I bet they are. I and I and I may go to that at some point, but. Okay, so as promised, I'm going to start by reading the statement. So today is October 30, 2013. My name is Philip Scarpino, Professor of History and Director of Oral History for the Tobias Center uh, for Leadership Excellence at Indiana University. Today I have the privilege to be interviewing Dr. Henry Mintzberg in downtown Montreal in a hotel suite in Fairmont, the Queen Elizabeth Hotel. I'm conducting this interview on behalf of the International Leadership Association and the Tobias Center for Leadership Excellence and we're both in attendance at the annual conference of the International Leadership Association. We'll include a more detailed biographical summary with the interview, so at this point I'll provide an abbreviated overview of Dr. Mintzberg's career. Henry Mintzberg is presently the Cleghorn Professor of Management Studies at McGill University, Montreal, Canada. He earned his PhD in Management from the Sloan School of Management, Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1968, and his Master's from the Sloan School of Management, MIT, in 1965. Since earning his Ph.D. in 1968, he's worked for McGill University with time out for a number of visiting positions, including uh, part-time at INSEAD, Fontainebleau, France, 1991 to 1999. Professor Mintzberg has published about 160 scholarly articles and 16 books with a focus on organization, strategy, management, and leadership. One window into the significance of the body of his research is his Google Scholar Citation Index, which shows lifetime 91,886 citations for 469 entries, with 37,756 since 2008. Say it again, 37,756 since 2008. Since 2008? Yes. Seriously? Seriously. There's 97,000 entries and half of them are since... Yeah. Since 2008, you said? Yes, your your lifetime total is 91,886. And since 2008, 37,756. Jesus. That's the, I, that, <laughs> you, yeah, you, you, you said the appropriate word right there. Some people have other things to do. amazing. <laughs> All right, Dr. Mintzberg has earned a number of awards and distinctions, just a few of the highlights. 17 honorary degrees between 1983 and 2012. He's Officer of the Order of Canada, 1998. He's elected a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, the International Academy of Management, World Academy of uh, Productivity Sciences. He twice earned the McKinsey Prize from the Harvard Business Review for the best article in 1975 and the second best in 1987. And of course, he is uh, a Leadership Legacy Award winner from the International Leadership Association. So, as promised, I'm asking your permission to record this interview, to transcribe this interview, and to deposit the recording in the IUPUI Special Collections and Archives where it may be used by its patrons and also to deposit it with the International Leadership Association and the Tobias Center. Agreed. All right, so we'll get started with the easy questions then. Uh, When and where were you born? Born in Montreal, Mm -hmm. right here. I'm probably a a walking distance from (laughs) where we're sitting uh, in 1939. On September 1st, the Germans invaded Poland. Mm -hmm. On the September 2nd, I was born. They took a day off, and on (laughs) September 3rd, uh, Britain declared war. Huh. And your parents coordinated all that? Yeah, you? yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right, so where did you grow up? I grew up in Montreal um, with a mother from New York, so we spent a fair amount of time in New York. But I grew up basically in Montreal and maybe just as importantly in the Laurentian Mountains oh. north of here because yeah. we always had a place in the country and that's in my blood and mm-hmm. I still... I have my own place. And you're a cross-country skier up there in the Laurentians? Well, I'm a cross-country skier off-track, mostly mm-hmm. off-trail, mm-hmm. bushwhacking, mm-hmm. where we have wide skis and big boots and mm-hmm. cables, and we go looking for lakes and looking for cr- ridges and crests. And we did that for many years every Saturday. So when you learned to cross-country ski, you were using the kind of skis where you pine tar the bottoms and have 10 or 15 different kinds of wax? Going back... Yeah, I mean, I, I went back to those days, yeah. except that there was a guy named Jack Rabbit Johansson who created skiing, not just skiing, in mm-hmm. North America. He was a Norwegian who lived to 113, and he brought cross-country skiing here. He also created the first downhill skiing anywhere by hooking up a cable around the flywheel of a car. Yeah. <coughs> and they came out with a w- Johansson wet and Johansson dry. Yeah. And I threw all the other waxes away. <laughs> In fact, I still have them. I never look at them. And I just did Johansson wet and Johansson dry. Oh. 
I asked you that because I used to be a cross country skier and I still have all my wax in a box yeah, in a closet. Yeah, so, so do I. But, <laughs> but I never used anything. Well, first I don't use Johansson wet because I it's no fun mm-hmm. when it's when it's wet. But I use Johansson dry. That's it. So, any brothers or sisters? I have one uh, one brother who passed away about three years ago. And t- tell me who your parents were. My parents were Mike. Uh, or Meyer, but Mike uh, was the name he used, who was a, a dress manufacturer. My mother was Irene from New York, um, who met my father in New York when he was working there, and then they moved back here during the Depression because mm-hmm. he got a good job <coughs> during the Depression. And um, my mother was basically a housewife who loved to write poems and things. And you said your dad was a dress manufacturer. Yeah. He was a designer? No, no, I mean, he owned the dress company. Mm-hmm. He was the inside guy, mm-hmm. and his Irish partner, classic Jewish Irish, <laughs> his Irish partner was the outside guy. Uh-huh. So he ran production and all that. They owned it jointly. Was your, your family uh, practicing Jews? Yeah, I'm, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, you know, there's such a range of practicing Judaism, but, yeah, I mean, they always belonged to a synagogue and mm-hmm. that kind of thing. They weren't very devout, but... My mother kept the house kosher and that kind of thing. But Does that have any impact on you as you grew up um, and became a man? And I sort of keep marginal ties. I belong to a synagogue here, which is a kind of, it's called Reconstruction, so it's a little bit like um, like Unitarian in a way. Well, I'm, I'm, that's not entirely fair. <laughs> but <laughs> it's, it's more of a kind of thoughtful Judaism. Mm-hmm. Um, so I keep ties. I think being... Jewish being a Montrealer and being Canadian have all influenced how I view the world um, uh, in some ways. I, the fact that I tend to be rather critical, some people say I'm, a, what do you call it, um, when you're a contrarian. I don't, I don't think I'm a contrarian, but some people say that. I think that probably... I can't say I've never heard that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I, I wouldn't say I'm contrarian. Um, come from um, uh, partly from being Jewish because I think there's a long tradition of that Um, but also being Canadian not that Canadians are contrarian at all or or critical at all but we live in a minority uh, in a small country against a big neighbor and we're always very suspicious Mm -hmm. of our big neighbor the way the Dutch are suspicious of of the Germans or the uh, New Zealanders are suspicious of the Australians. And I think that's probably had an influence too because I'm, and be my mother being American, I'm almost American. Most Canadians are almost American anyway, but I'm more almost American and yet Canadian. So, so it's enabled me to see things differently than people in the U.S. mainstream. I think. So do you think it's important for somebody to be able to look at the world through eyes that are different than their own culture? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, although I'm not sure I'd say that. I would say I look at the world through eyes different than the dominant culture, mm-hmm. which is not our own culture, but but the You're U.S. culture. The yeah, the yeah. U.S. culture is so dominant worldwide, and especially we're on the front line. So Pierre Trudeau used to talk about the United States in terms of sleeping with an elephant. Yeah, and when the elephant rolls, uh, you're a mouse. And <laughs> yeah. he said, "We're the mice. We're the mouse." And when the elephant rolls over, friendly as it may be, <laughs> you're in trouble. So uh, there's a bit of that. Yeah. So, Nina, do you think that, that that really had had an influence on the on the way you look at the world and the way you develop your scholarship and that kind of thing? Yeah. Okay. Being Canadian, particularly, and being Montrealer as well, because <clears throat> Montreal is different from Toronto or Vancouver or other places in the sense that <clears throat> we're it's a very eclectic culture, mm-hmm. Montreal. It's a very eclectic city. People who want to <coughs> be in Europe but have to be in North America favor Montreal mm-hmm. and uh, because it's kind of the closest you can get. So in that sense, you're, you're raised in a very open, kind of interesting world. So you think that the openness of Montreal society has had an, an influence on the way you look at the world and practice your scholarship? Yeah. I mean, you're the historian, so you can answer that question better than I can. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm not supposed to lead the witness. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, 
I, everything presumably has an influence. What that influence is is hard to tell. It's a question of interpretation, and that is your job in a way. Although I know historians are just supposed to tell it like it is. No, we interpret. We, <laughs> I mean, we, inter we interpret. Historian, you're not allowed to develop theory if you're a good historian. Uh, you know, but some of the most interesting historians uh, uh, develop very interesting theory. Truly really do. Um, I'm going to I'm going to ask you a, a a question to see if I can get you to reflect on your childhood and youth. Um, and we'll, either this will work or it won't. But um, I want to just for the for the record and for somebody using this interview, I'm going to ask you a series of questions organized around the question: Who is Henry Mintzberg, or how did Henry Mintzberg become the person that William Litwack referred to as Henry Mintzberg in quotes, or the Steven Spielberg of his profession? More broadly, how did you become the person that the Economist referred to as Guru Henry Mintzberg, or the Harvard Business Review ranked as one of the 50 most influential management gurus of all time. Mm -hmm. So do you think of yourself as a guru heading off in new scholarly directions that people can follow if they want to? Uh, I don't like the word guru. I prefer um, uh, Swami. Uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Why? <laughs> well, uh, uh, partly uh, that's contrarian, isn't it? But par partly because guru is... Uh, is so misused and overused and, and has been used for some people who have been very superficial, not mm -hmm. all, but mm -hmm. some. Um, so uh, so uh, I'm more of a swami in the sense that I'm an educator and a mm -hmm. kind of opener of thought, I hope. Um, but, but what are you asking if I'm... Yeah. Do you think of yourself that way? Oh, do I think of myself? No, I don't think of myself. Well, do I think of myself as a guru? I, I guess the sort of broader way of thinking that question is what influence have I had on other people yeah. because that's I think the same question in a way and um, and it's kind of interesting and those citation figures are interesting I haven't seen them um, because um, I know I've influenced many people and I, and I hear from many people um, I don't think I have had a sort of a compelling influence on the way things are going since I would say that almost everything I've done uh, or I've proposed or not proposed but, but stood for has been uh, diametrically contradicted or contradicted by what's been going on. In other words, it's almost as if if I said something, the world will, will automatically go the other way. Now, <laughs> I don't have enough influence for that to happen. <clears throat> I might... I might kid myself into believing that I slowed it down a bit mm -hmm. um, in the sense that, that you know, r through questions, questioned things that were happening. Um, but I think there's something going on now. That's why I'm talking about those figures you cited. Because I'm getting more and more kind of approaches from different kinds of people. Um, I mean, I know that in strategy or general management right. or whatever, people read my stuff and they know it. But I'm getting all kinds of people um, in all kinds of ways that, you know, I, I, I have no reputation outside of management uh, as far as I'm concerned, but, <laughs> but it seems to be getting around somehow. My ideas seem to be getting around, maybe because things are so out of whack right now in my view, and I guess we'll get back to that, but I think things are so out of whack right now that maybe I've, as one of people, uh, stand for sort of an alternate way of viewing the world, of viewing management, of viewing organizations, and with them, what I'm working on now, of viewing the whole trend in society. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to follow up and ask you an, an open-ended question, and I know it's open-ended, but what do you think is out of whack? Oh well, that's my pamphlet, uh, my electronic <laughs> pamphlet called Rebalancing mm -hmm. Society. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, this pamphlet is about the imbalance that is happening increasingly so in society today. And I go back to, no, I go farther back, but uh, I, I go back to 1789 when I believe that the U.S. Constitution, in order to, um, in order to um, um, counter the effect of, the, of, of royalty, yeah. um, uh, emphasized individual rights at the expense of collective rights and I think America has been on a steady course to imbalance on the side of individual rights 
and 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 I think in 1989 was a kind of tipping point in the sense that the interpretation of the fall of the communist regimes in Eastern Europe was that capitalism had triumphed. I think balance triumphed in the sense that the Eastern European countries were utterly out of balance mm -hmm. on the side of their uh, public sectors. And we had balance, more or less, the U.S., mm -hmm. even the U.S., although less so, but still, France, Canada, England, uh, not England, France, Canada, Germany, more so, balance between public, private, and I prefer to call it plural sector, mm -hmm. call it civil society, whatever you want. But because we misinterpreted that, we've been going steadily, or the U.S. in particular has been going steadily out of balance ever since on the side of the private sector. Um, and, and that's what I'm kind of challenging right now. That's what I'm writing about right now. How do you think Canada's done in terms of that balance? Well, Canada was quite balanced. Our current prime minister is off the scale. Um, and in trouble. <laughs> right. This week. <laughs> couldn't happen to a more miserable guy. I, he's a miserable guy. He's a bully. Um, and he's in deeper and deeper every day. And the more he tries to get out of it, the deeper he gets like a, like a swamp. Um, and, um, uh, but Canada itself has been shifting. It, to me, it always held the line. And, you know, in terms of not subscribing to a lot of things that were popular in the U.S., the most obvious example being Medicare. Uh, which is sacred in Canada. It's not just a program. It's sacred. Um, even that's under attack now. And, and partly it's, it's a, quite a right-wing government, uh, probably the most right-wing government in the uh, Western world. Um, but partly um, there's a shift in, in Canada happening. There's a kind of meanness that I find shocking uh, because this isn't a country of mean people. And it shows up in hockey most obviously, I mean, in a crazy way, um, but it shows up in lots of other ways. And there are lots of thoughtful, decent Canadians, just as there are lots of thoughtful, decent Americans, but the thoughtful, decent Americans have lost control of their country, I think. And you just look at what's going on in Congress yeah. and so on. Um, and we're on the first way, but this is going across the entire country. And now with the trade talks between the EU and the US, where the, the, the lobbyists are swarming around it, particularly the American, mm -hmm. and, they're, um, and they're forcing a kind of lowest common denominator regulatory system. If the Europeans give up, give in to that, I think that's a tipping point for them too, and the world. I'm going to back way up and ask you a question, yeah. and we're going to come back to some of these topics. But um, So this relates to your childhood and youth, and I'm going to set this up for the, for the benefit of anybody who listens to this. Um, October 2011, I had the pleasure of interviewing Manfred Ketz de Vries at the ILA meeting in London. And in prepping for that, I read an article that he published in 1994 called The Leadership Mystique. Um, you knew him. You, wor you know. worked at Institute, so We're friends, yeah. He says in, in this article, and I'll just read a couple of lines, and I'll, I want to see if I can get you to comment on that. He said, all of us possess some kind of inner theater and are strongly motivated by a specific inner script. Over time, through interactions with caretakers, teachers, and other influential people, this inner theater develops. Our inner theater, in which the patterns that underlie our character come into play, influences our behavior throughout our lives and plays an essential role in the molding of leaders. So here's the question. If we use his, Katz de Vries, uh, description of inner theater, can you tell me about your inner theater? What, what is it? Who did you interact with as a, as a youth, or what experiences did you have that shaped the person that you are now? I'm not sure I can pinpoint any specific experiences. Um, I see myself as kind of a why not person instead of a why person, <laughs> in the sense of if I kind of like slightly nutty ideas, if they're thoughtful. I mean, there's plenty of crazy ideas out there, but. But I like the idea of breaking away and doing something different and seeing the world mm -hmm. a little differently. And so I've always um, had that. But I can't, I can't point to any sort of event or mentor or, or anything like that that pushed me that way. I, I can't think of any of that in my past. Father and mother? Um, no. 
Um, my father was more conventional. Mm -hmm. My mother was very loving and very uh, accepting. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure she pushed me to think differently. I wouldn't say that. In fact, the community I was raised in, kind of quite a narrow Jewish community, uh, was not one for thinking differently. I mean, it was one for thinking creatively and all that, but not one for breaking away particularly. It's very narrow. In fact, this community is probably one of the strongest communities in North America in support of Israel, mm -hmm. despite the things that I think are going on that shouldn't be going on. So, fairly conventional conservative community, but somehow, as soon as I hit McGill, uh, in high school, you're in your geographic community. Mm -hmm. As soon as I hit McGill, I immediately got involved with all kinds of other people and all kinds of other things, but not because anything dragged me into it, but because I was predisposed to it, I mm -hmm. guess. And so I've always been. There was a turning point, actually, um, and you can read about it because I wrote it up. There was a turning point, although I think I was headed there anyway. Um, I, um, I did an article in the Harvard Business Review called Planning on the Left Side and Managing on the Right. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and, 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 and it was about the two hemispheres of the brain and, mm -hmm. uh, and how that kind of influences behavior. And, and I sent that to Herbert Simon, who to me was the most outstanding management thinker ever. Hmm. Um, Carnegie Mellon, and responsible for a whole new wave of... Uh, of management education that started in the 50s at Carnegie and so on um, because he had become a cognitive psychologist and I thought well he knows more about this stuff than I do and I sent it to him and said what do you think and he wrote back essentially saying it's bunk um, he just dismissed it he was polite and pleasant mm -hmm. and wrote a nice letter but he basically dismissed it and then I got a telegram at that point. I was in France mm -hmm. saying we need the article from the Harvard Business Review saying we need the article immediately. And I had like 24 hours or 48 hours. And it wasn't quite done. Uh, it was done. Okay. It was done. But should I pull it? Mm -hmm. And the, the decision rested on whether Simon knew something I didn't or whether Simon was blocked. And I decided he was blocked. And I never looked back. Mm -hmm. um, and that correspondence, including my reply to him, mm -hmm. is in a book called Mintzberg on Management. There's a little right. section that has that correspondence, which I think you might find interesting. And do you remember approximately when that was? Well, it's, it's in there. Um, well, it's 17... Uh, 17 <laughs> not, it's Freudian Either slip. one of us is that old. <laughs> Freudian slip. 1976, I yeah. think, was the publication of that article. So you actually have two undergraduate degrees. You mentioned McGill, but uh, you attended McGill University here in Montreal, majored in mechanical engineering in uh, 1961, I think you entered. Yeah. Uh, McGill was one of two English language universities here yeah. at that point. Um, so, so why so McGill and why mechanical engineering? Um, probably for no better reason than I like to take engines apart mm -hmm. and put them back together with a few screws missing. Um, so I always had that predisposition. I think I'm kind of like a mechanical engineer. I, I was at a conference years later, turned out to be with a bunch of mechanical engineers. I haven't spent time with those guys since I graduated. It's like 20 years later. And they were kooky. We were taking a shortcut through a field and getting mud, you know, mud up to our knees. And I thought, these guys are as crazy as I am. I must be, <laughs> must be something about mechanical engineers. So I think I am a sort of predisposition Manfred's theater script that maybe I'm a mechanical engineer at heart. The one thing that's always been left is I use a lot of graphs and a lot of diagrams in what I write. And that, I don't think it kind of comes from mechanical engineering, but it's probably the reason I went into mechanical engineering. I just have that predisposition. So were you one of these teenagers that was in an engine up to his elbows with grease all over his hands? And yeah, sometimes, yeah. yeah. I would, uh, particularly outboard motors up in the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, just, I don't know why. I just take or get old ones that nobody wanted and take them apart to look at what's what's going on. So I forget what I was leading up to. Where were we? Anyway, I, I um, oh oh, just my uh, predisposition for uh, oh, why mechanical engineering? Yeah, uh, probably nothing more than that because I never practiced it. 
at the same time that you were at McGill earning your degree in mechanical engineering, you were also busy earning a BA in general arts from what was then Sir George Williams, now Concordia, in the evenings. Yeah, that um, was actually sequential because they only required me to do about five courses oh. to get a BA. So I did it while I was working for the Canadian National okay. Railways. And um, I just thought, you know, with all this engineering, I should get educated. So I took some English courses and things like that. Mm -hmm. And it was just because you wanted a different kind of just education? Just wanted to get educated. <laughs> 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 just to, to get more broadly educated. And Sir George Williams at that time, that was the other English language. So There were actually... Concordia was a merger of Sir George Williams and Loyola. Right. So there were technically three. So you've lived in Quebec and Montreal most of your life. Do you speak French? Yeah. yeah. We can do this in French. If no, you no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I can read French, but the, yeah. my pronunciation is, is awful. No, I lecture in French. Um, um, okay. Um, but I've lived, I've probably, I think I counted about eight years abroad. Yeah. In, in just Europe. Not mm -hmm. counting four years in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, at MIT, um, but eight years abroad. I think five of those, counting summers and everything mm -hmm. in France. Mm -hmm. um, so here you are. You've taken a degree in mechanical engineering. You then go to work for Canadian National Railways. You're earning a night degree in a completely different area at a different university. At what point did you realize that you really weren't like most other people? <laughs> <laughs> I think, the, I, I think the <laughs> interesting question. I think, I think the answer to that is from day one and never. <laughs> never. <laughs> well, we're all like each other. I don't think I'm so much unlike other people in some respects. I mean, we're all we're all unlike everybody else, okay. and we're all like everybody else. Okay. I don't think I ever reached a point where I kind of thought, I'm just a different person. I mean, there are people like, I don't know, painters or whoever, mm -hmm. or maybe Van Gogh kind of realized very early that he just wasn't like other people. I don't think psychologically I ever felt I was unlike other people. What I did discover gradually over time is that I have a capacity for synthesis. Mm -hmm. um, but there was no moment. I mean, it's just sort of built up. I realized that what I do best is synthesize and categorize. I'm a, I'm a quintessential categorizer. Yeah. I'm just trying to imagine how many other successful people there are who begin their education as an engineer, realize they need further study in the humanities, and then combine the two of those and are willing to, to work at both of them. Mm. Probably some, but uh, I mean, there are a lot of engineers who've gone on to do. Uh, Chomsky's an engineer. Isn't That's true. <laughs> so there are people like that, okay. but but um, actually a few other. What's his name? That very controversial writer in the U.S. He's also, I think, mechanical engineer. Short guy wrote a book about Marilyn Monroe and. Uh, um, I know who you mean, but I'm gonna. Very famous yeah. guy. Anyway, I think he was an engineer too. So. It happens. Um, I, th I think that turning point with the Simon article sort of took me to, it took me, took me off, a, off, an, off a knife edge from coming from the analytic side, mechanical engineering, and also um, working in operations research, which was very analytic, um, and, and just kind of having that predisposition to, in fact, the only thing I would ever, I think, repudiate of what I wrote is a chapter of my first book that is a very mechanistic mm -hmm. view of managerial work. Um, I've never wrote anything like that since. But, but there was this kind of analysis intuition thing, and I think after that Simon correspondence, it kind of mm -hmm. legitimized my own sense of going on the other side and being much more open to things like intuition. and. So, so a, a mechanistic view of management, is that something that was influenced by what you were reading at the time or yeah, you were probably. studying with? As well? Yeah, and MIT. Yeah. yeah. It was kind of like sort of a, a series of programs or flowcharts right. for describing managerial work. Um, now, I've, 
I, I, I have a collection of notes for a book I want to do eventually called What I Really Think. Um, and that probably reveals more than anything because I think all kinds of things that I'm not supposed to think. Mm-hmm. Um, not that it gets in my harm's way. People say, I'm very courageous. I'm not courageous. I'll sit in my basement and write outrageous things. That's not courageous. It's not, people who are on battlefields or dealing with the wounded or whatever are courageous. I'm well, not. I'm well, different not. kinds of courage. Yeah, yeah, but I don't think it takes much courage to write things that people say, oh boy, that's not conventional. I don't think that takes much courage. But, but um, for example, the way I'm going to open that book is by quoting an article that appeared in the New York Times about the equinox. Okay. And it was a, an article by a proper academic, obviously, uh, about all the mysticism and other things that go with the equinox. And at one point he says, he writes, um, people even think you can set eggs on their end during the equinox. Can you imagine that? This is like throwing me a, lobbing me a, right. a ball that I can hit over the fence. So I wrote to him, and I said, well, have you ever tried? I mean, after all, this is the most testable right. Right. <laughs> experiment you can possibly do. I do it every equinox. I'm not j- joking with you. I do it every equinox. Maybe you should try it. And, I wrote, and then at the end I said, but don't tell your friends. Because um, he's obviously a very pretentious academic. So I'm going to open with this story and then this and I'm going to talk about the pretentiousness of scientists who yeah. believe that everything that hasn't been discovered can't those scientists who believe that everything that hasn't been discovered can't possibly exist and um, so I have no hesitation at all in setting eggs up on their end and flaunting it um, so here we go find them for you. I used to have them on the sc- screen, but I took it off. Not that I don't so mind having it on the screen. He's looking anyway, keep talking. I'll find no, you the he's eggs. Looking, looking at the screen of his phone for the picture of the eggs on end. I, I actually wanted to ask you uh, to talk briefly. When you got your undergraduate degree, you went to, into operational research for Canadian National Railway. What did yeah. you do there? What were you doing for uh, Canadian National Railway? I was fishing in a hump yard mostly. <laughs> You're doing what? <laughs> it was fishing in a hump yard. And so what does that mean? Oh my goodness, there it is. That's on our stove at home. <laughs> now, <laughs> does it only work on the equinox? It works on the Chinese New Year. Uh, no, I kid you not. <laughs> I, once, I once said to somebody about this, and they said, yeah, it works on the Chinese New Year too, which it does. Okay. It works three days a year. Well, a bit more, because you can usually do it a little bit before and after. Um... I, um, you know, operations research, it was operational research, which was the British term. And operations research research is the American term. But the Americans like Arnoff and Acoff and Churchill and those people took it much more, especially Acoff, uh, Arnoff, no, Acoff, took it much more into a toolkit, a bag of Mm -hmm. tools. Whereas for the Brits, it was just creative problem solving. Using numbers and Mm -hmm. using analytical thinking. So we had a hump yard. A hump yard is where you r- resort the cars okay. as they come off. You know, they, they back the car up and they release the cars one by one over a little hill okay. and then calculate the, the exit speed necessary for that car to go on the, any one of 80 tracks to couple with the other cars to go. Okay. So each track would have a train going to a different place. Well, it wasn't working. It was chaos because because the the measurements were just too it was an analog computer but it was much too sophisticated uh, than and and it wasn't working either the cars would come short which would use up track mm-hmm. and create problems or uh they would smash into each other 12 miles an hour and 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 you know i i saw cars saying china where do not hump <laughs> <laughs> smashing <laughs> so they sent me out to the hump yard with a fishing rod mm-hmm. and the fishing rod had a magnet on the end, and as the car, one car was approaching, I was sort of sampling, I'd put the magnet on the car, it would come out, and I, there was a speedometer, and I'd record the speed, and then I did a histogram, which was, which should have looked like from two to four, five miles an hour like this, instead there was a big zero miles an hour, it never made it, and then this thing went up to about 12 miles an hour. If you want to find out how organizations work, watch a boxcar hitting another boxcar at 12 miles an hour. That's very impressive. <laughs> and there were 
coupling gear all over the yard. And all. So the vice president, I was just a kid, the vice president in charge of um, uh, research, uh, who I worked for through who the OR group reported to, um, had a meet, had, there was a meeting of vice presidents, and the head of the St. Lawrence region was at that meeting, praising his yard, and this other guy threw this histogram in front of him and said, here, this is what's going on in your yard. So that, 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 was, that was the thing I most remember doing at the uh, Canadian National. So they were, were very you, creative people. Were you able to help them? Uh, did, the, did, did your work fix the problem? No, I don't know if it, I, I, I didn't last that long to, uh, to find out. I wasn't, I was just sort of the flunky sent out to, I'm uh, not flunky, but you know, the new kid on the block right. sent out to check what the speeds were. Um, but but I worked with very creative people. One guy is always a good friend, John Gratwick. Eh, it's a long story, but he was going to get rid of engines altogether and have these mushrooms installed on tracks. They they actually came up with these mushrooms. Somebody in the UK came up with these mushrooms where if a car hit the mushroom at too low a speed, it would let the car go by but boost it on the way up. Mm -hmm. If it came at too fast a speed it would put resistance and slow it down. So this guy thought we could install these mushrooms across 22,000 miles of track and get rid of engines, just send the cars out one at a time. I mean, that's the kind of creative thinking was going on there. So I was going to ask you what you learned from this experience before you moved on. I guess. You the value of creativity? <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you could learn, I mean, you learn about, uh, you also learn about um, the fact that you can be creative and you can come up with mm -hmm. outrageous ideas. You're going to get slapped down by someone, but. You know, I didn't get raised in a bureaucrat environment that said protect your rear end. I wasn't. When I went to um, to vocational testing in high school, uh, mechanical sort mm -hmm. of things came up top. So they said I should be an accountant. Why? Because a good Jewish boy shouldn't mm -hmm. be an engineer, he should be an accountant. Mm -hmm. So for a couple of weeks I walked around. I think there was a company called Ross, Ross, Ross and Ross, and a friend of mine said it's going to be called Ross, 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 Ross and Minsper. <laughs> but anyway, I walked around for about two weeks, and then at the end of two weeks, I said, what kind of nonsense is this? I can't think of anything less suited to me than accounting. So I went into mechanical engineering. Huh. So I did have the courage to um, sort of, you know, not go with the flow kind of thing. So you left the Canadian Railroad and. 1963, went on to do graduate work at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, master's in 65, PhD in 68. Yeah, I actually didn't want to go to a business school at all. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be involved with those guys. Um, so I applied in, I always wanted to do industrial engineering, but McGill didn't have it, so I did mechanical engineering. And then um, I applied to NYU and got in in industrial engineering. Mm -hmm. And then I was in New York, and I called if I could see some people, and they gave me a runaround, and I said, this isn't good. So I applied to Columbia, got in there, um, and, uh, <clears throat> and then on a lark, applied to MIT. It was called a Master of Science. It wasn't right. called an MBA at that time. And I spoke to a really lovely guy named Sebastian B. Tower, who was running the uh, uh, Industrial Engineering mm -hmm. Department at mm -hmm. Columbia, and I said, I got into MIT, and he said, go there, they'll do much better for you. Is one of these wonderful turning points, huh. and so I went there, and um, and then swung over completely to the other side, to the you know away from the OR, sort of analytical side. So I mean, you really kind of stumbled into MIT as opposed to. I think I probably stumbled into most everything that worked. Yeah. Um. So you wrote a dissertation titled "The Manager." At work. I mean, I stumbled and I didn't. I did apply to MIT. No, I know that, but I mean, but, you yeah, didn't. You didn't. So it's, it's always you, like you, there was not a straight line from no, the guilt to no, MIT. That, no, I, exactly. I didn't mean that in a pejorative sense. I but. no, no, no. I know. No, no. I accept that I stumbled into it, I, but I think there was some. You know what Isaac the Shiva singer said about free will and. He said, you've got to believe in free will, you've got no choice. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, you know, things happen and opportunities happen. You never know why you, you bump into the right people and things work out perfectly or whatever. Um, but you also kind of set them up too. Or, you, or at least you, you open up the possibilities that these things mm -hmm. can happen. So, you're, I'm going to read the title of your dissertation to get it in the work. A manager at work determining his activities, roles, and programs by structured observation. 
uh, which with additional work became your first book, right? The Nature of Management. Yeah, see, the programs is the part I was talking about yeah. earlier. Um, that's the... That's so the, I, what yeah. I was actually what interested in was the part about an observational study of managers at work. Um, yeah, I remember my advisor telling me that a thesis has to be elegant. Yeah. And I always prided myself in the fact that my thesis was not elegant. The results may have been elegant, yeah. but the method, he was referring to the method, the okay. method wasn't elegant. And I've always, I've, I've written a number of pieces on research, kind of boasting yeah. about the fact that I prefer inelegant methods, because people get so caught up discussing, you know, statistical tests and everything else. I, I one point I said, what's wrong with a sample of one? You know, uh, Piaget studied his own children. So. so for the benefit of somebody who might listen to this recording and be way outside of your field, could you just very briefly explain what structured observation is, and then I want to follow up on that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's nothing very fancy. It just means that you're observing. You're flying the wall, in this case, observing managers. So you're flying the wall. You're following around for a week. Um, and structured in the sense that I had all these categories that I, you know, I was writing down the duration of activities, who they were with, what the subject matter was, you know, all that kind of thing. So in a way, it was observation, but entering the data in kind of structured categories, as well as taking notes about the general. So was structured observation an accepted method in that field at well, that I, time? I think I coined the term. I don't think... That's what I'm asking you without yeah. trying to... <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, I think I used that term. Um, to that point, there was almost no studies of managerial work, almost none. Mm -hmm. There was a woman in England named Rosemary Stewart who was doing diary studies. Mm -hmm. So she was studying the written diary. But of course, you miss a lot of the informal stuff that way, because a lot of things happen that aren't put in a diary. So there were few managerial studies. And almost I, none, yeah. And no one was doing what you called structured observation. Not that I came across. They were also doing activity sampling where, you know, when a bell went off, they would break down what they're doing or something. Yeah. No, nobody, to my mind, was doing structure. So, doing observation. not a big thing. I mean, it's obvious. If you want to find out what managers do, just go look. Well, it was obvious to you, but, but no one else was doing it. So, what, what led you down that path? Oh, well, actually, that story is, is articulated somewhere. Um, uh, James Webb was running NASA at the time, and he wanted to be studied because he thought he had some secrets to management. And, um, and he knew people at the Sloan School at MIT, right. so he approached them with this idea. And there was no policy department, there was no general management department, there, were only, there was nothing. I was the, I, I, I wanted to do my doctrine and what, it was, called, what, it, what it was called policy or strategy now, um, uh, and uh, there was no professor of strategy, there was no uh, department of strategy, but they're, you know, MIT is a wonderful live and let live kind of place, like the OR department at the Canadian National, I guess I always sort right. of ended up in places <laughs> like that, now that I think about it, so, of course, it's the engineering sort of orientation, too, I'm sure, what the hell, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> but they were willing to give you that creative license. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So, so, so Webb invited a bunch of them to go in his plane to tour all the facilities. And there was only the one doctoral student who was remotely interested in anything like that, so they invited me along. And we went to Cape Canaveral, and we met Werner von Braun, and we had a great trip. Yeah. And, um, and I got back and said, look, this is crazy. I can't study this guy for a PhD thesis at MIT. So I tried to do something else. And it didn't get anywhere. I was going to do a book on uh, a thesis on strategic planning, believe it or not, which I ended up criticizing mm -hmm. in another book. And um, by that time, Webb was embroiled in politics and unavailable, so I found five other people to study, and I observed them. So you basically developed this method of strategic or of structured observation. Yeah. Yeah, I and don't take much credit for that. I, um, I think it's pretty straightforward. I mean, did, did it catch on? I mean, because, hey, let's face it, in anthro that's what anthropologists do. I, I was going to say that, but I, I, I mean, it does sound a little bit like the, yeah, the it's methodology kind of and anthropology. Yeah. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. And, and people have pointed that out. And, and, but uh, did you know that at the time? No. Okay. No, I hadn't probably read a single article on anthropology mm -hmm. at that point. I read Gertz later, but mm -hmm. uh, 
No, I hadn't read anything like that. And did did, did that method then catch on in your field? I mean, did yeah. nobody have you continued to do it? A little bit. I did it. Um, yeah, I well, I studied these five people in '68, um, and then or '67, I guess, and then uh, many years later, in the mid to late '90s, I observed uh, 29 managers for a day each. Mm -hmm. uh, so my sample is not 29 managers; 29 managerial days. Mm -hmm. um, and my book, Managing, and now a mm -hmm. short version of that called Simply Managing, is based significantly on that. So I did go back and, and do that. It wasn't structured observation, it was more observation. Mm -hmm. I was just writing down things more or less informally. So when you were in graduate school, who were the gurus? Who were the people, Simon, the must-reads? Simon, Simon, and Simon. Okay. Um, March was starting, well March had done some earlier books with Simon that were important. Mm -hmm. uh, Syert. Ever that whole Carnegie crowd. Mm -hmm. um, Levitt was kind of big. If at Stanford was mm -hmm. kind of big in, in organizational behavior. Uh, in, in operations research, you had the Churchman Aronoff, Akoff book, and those people. Uh, Igor Ansoff wrote a book in 1965 on strategic planning. Mm -hmm. was like, uh, I'm trying to think. And there was a Harvard people, Andrew's book on mm -hmm. strategy, mm -hmm. Ken Andrews. It, well, Andrews, uh, he, he wrote a book, but also they did the case book, bunched mm -hmm. them together, Joe yeah. Bauer, Andrews, and all those people. Um, probably a lot of others I can't think of. So, at what point did you begin to realize that you disagreed with much of the received wisdom? I mean, you're... Sort of uh, right it. from the beginning, I think. Uh, well, I mean, beginning of my academic career. Mm -hmm. um, certainly my thesis was uh, a very harsh critique of conventional view of managing as planning, organizing, coordinating, and controlling uh, from Fayol and Kuntz and O'Donnell and all those people. They were mm -hmm. the principles of management people um, that I was very critical of because uh, it just didn't match with what I saw in that office. So. Right from the beginning, I'm looking at this saying, my God, what's going on here? There's nothing like what you read. So for the benefit, again, of somebody who's going to listen to this recording or read the transcript and they're really not in your field, I mean, what was the, the nature of your critique? I mean, what, what were the, the key in elements? The, in managerial work. Yeah, yeah. That managers get interrupted a lot, that they, um, that they jump from one thing to another, that the job is largely oral, they don't do a lot of reading. Um, that it's very action oriented, go, 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 do, 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 um, no time to be thoughtful, uh, that kind of thing. So here you are, you, you write this dissertation, you defend your dissertation, you're going to launch a career as a young scholar. Did you ever worry about swimming against the academic current? No. Never? You know, I, not for a minute. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that ever entered my head. But I'll tell you how I got tenure, if you want. <laughs> I was. I took a sabbatical in France in Aix en Provence, and we we, we stayed a second year because we we're having such a good time. And they paid in France for the second year. Yeah. And the dean called. I can't remember. It was the first year or the second year? And he said, "Congratulations, you got tenure." And I said, "Oh, I didn't even know I was up for tenure." No dossier. No Nothing. letters. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> so, you could say McGill was sloppy. I don't think McGill was sloppy. I think that McGill is very tolerant. Place. That was the uh, common procedure in those days, too, as well, I think. I guess it was a, less, a, a much less formal yeah. procedure. A colleague of mine just did a 100-page dossier for her tenure review, right. <coughs> which I think is completely nuts. Um, so I, it's not as if, you know, I set out to write a book right away. Right. If you look at my publication of articles at the start, by the time, if I had to go up for a five-year tenure review or six-year tenure review now, well, I had... Just at the edge of it, I had a Harvard Business Review uh, McKinsey Prize winner. Right. But, of course, that doesn't count because that's not an A journal. So, <laughs> Is that you know, right? for, for proper academics. <laughs> you know, proper academics. So I had some refereed publications, but not a lot. I probably would have got tenure, but it would have been marginal. I, was, I spent my time writing a book called The Nature yeah. of Man Managerial right. Work, or at least revising my thesis. So... We talked a little earlier when the recording was off about the fact that uh, you hired a young man to uh, 
basically help you edit your dissertation. And it was William Litwack. Yeah, it was uh, grammatical kind of, yeah. yeah. Um, y you've known... I remember, by the way, this is a cute anecdote. I was up north and I was working on it. My mother was kind of helping me a bit too. And she kept saying, Henry, what about this? Henry, what about this? And I said, Mom, just, I was doing something. I said, Mom, just put ACK in the margin. And she said, ACK? And I said, yeah, awkward. Awkward, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was a good engineer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I wanna, I'm going to ask you a, a, a couple of questions. And the first one is, when you started out, were you a good writer? I asked Bill that question. Uh, I did. Yeah, he said no. I'm sure he said no. I, I don't know if I should betray a confidence. No, he did no, say no. Yeah. Of course he said no. I, uh, I think I had a certain flair, but, but Bill would be concerned about misuse of words, terrible grammar, mm -hmm. all that. And, um, and in that sense, he was absolutely right. He's still picking up. Yesterday, he was picking up words. Henry, that, that's a misuse of that word. That's not what you mean. And so <laughs> I still do that, but much less often now. So he told me he yells at his clients. Did he yell at you? His clients? He yells <laughs> at me more than anybody. Are you kidding? I was once with a friend, and Bill was, she couldn't believe. By this time, my reputation was established, and she was a professor of business, and she couldn't believe this guy screaming at me about how oh, this is wrong and that's wrong. And <laughs> Well, I mean, I've read enough of your work. But he's the only one who, who ever did it that way. I, I've had, like, Nan Stone, when she was editor of the Harvard Business Review, edited my piece, Crafting Strategy. And she was brilliant, but she never yelled at me. I mean, I've read enough of your work to, to I mean, I think your writing is quite elegant. <laughs> but did, did Most you of it is not edited. Did you have to work hard at becoming a good writer, is, is the question that I'm after. It was... Was it a skill that you had to develop over a period of time? Bill would say yes, but I think writing came naturally to me. Mm -hmm. I just needed to rough out, you know, smooth out a lot of rough edges. I don't think I became a good writer. I think I think I probably had a predisposition to be able to say things in ways that were compelling to some people, um, but I don't think. Uh, I think what I needed to learn is how to just, you know, it was very, very sloppy. It's like making a nice piece of furniture, but it's very rough until you bring the sandpaper. So what do you think the secret to good writing is? What, what do you think is the secret to good writing, effective writing? Well, I'm not sure if it's everybody's secret, but I write for myself. And I am, Bill notwithstanding, I am my own harshest critic, mm -hmm. much harsher than Bill. I can show you by now maybe 15 drafts of this pamphlet I'm working mm -hmm. on. And you will see stuff slashed out, crossed out, uh, all over the place from beginning to end. I, <coughs> I remember once reading that there are poets who write it all down. And there are poets, there's a poem that went through 93 drafts. I'm like the second. The 93 kind. drafts yeah. poet. Um, I do, uh, I just revise and revise and revise and revise until it just reads right to me. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't read right to me, I just keep revising. I understand you write in longhand. Yes. Don't use a computer? No. My, it goes to my, to Santa. Yeah. Uh, and then I correct on hard copy and it goes back to Santa. Maybe by the last draft I'll enter it myself. Um, occasionally, I'll do so. I did something, a piece on Japan about the 10 lost years. Mm -hmm. I think I did that straight on the computer. Um, mm -hmm. I can do it, but, mm -hmm. but I find I, I... You know what? The computer takes over. Uh, the keyboard takes over. Because writing is about integrating. Writing is taking a phenomenon that's not linear, unless it's a diary, right. And putting it in linear form. Whatever you're writing, whether it's not linear, manage your work is not right. linear. Mm -hmm. But a book on manage your work has a first word and a last word and all the words in between, except for diagrams to give you a bit more flexibility. But otherwise, it's all linear. Right. So the hard part of writing is to express something that's not linear in linear form. That that's that's the hardest part of writing. And uh, and um, so outlines matter. I forget why I was gonna where I was at to say that. But 
but to me that's the key to uh, your question was how did, um, um, and learning about writing but what did yeah. you ask her? I asked you two, two questions I said did you have to learn to become a good writer yeah and what would you say would be the, the secret to, or the to effective writing yeah I guess it's to convey yeah. a nonlinear phenomenon in linear order um, and and but also uh, to, to be able to come to a turn of phrase that kind of engage people so is that where the humanist meets the engineer, finding that turn of phrase? Yeah, you could say the linear order is yeah. the engineer. Yeah, so I never thought about it that way, but yeah, and the uh, and the turn of phrase is much a very intuitive thing. You know, it happened yesterday or this morning, I think. Um, sometime I'm writing and I'm searching for a word, and it pops into my head. And I write it down, and I sort of think well, I'm the medium, uh, and uh, and I and I sort of think, I sort of say thank you, like wherever this is coming from. Now there was a, a guy, an unge uneducated guy in Brazil, who ostensibly wrote about 150 books, each of them in the, in the style of some dead scientist. So he wrote books about chemistry and all these things, and. The only possible explanation is that he's some kind of medium <laughs> through which they're <laughs> publishing their unpublished books. Now, if you think of that, it's crazy. But why is it crazy? I mean, why isn't it possible? I, 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 I'm not a mystic, yeah. um, but I do say there's lots of things we don't understand. So why can't that be possible? Why not? I mean, how do dogs find their way home 500 miles? I mean, they don't smell it. No. So... There's something going on, and there are these phenomena like aches going up on their end yeah. and all that. So, so um, I'm not sure I'm a medium for everything I do. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot about what I'm writing, but I do get these things yeah. popping into my head. Uh, there was a book called "The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind," uh, and the only thing incomprehensible is the title. Yeah. Uh, the rest of the book is actually quite easy to read, as I recall. And it, and it basically says that you um, that there was a time when the gods spoke directly to us. Uh, this is our perceptions. Mm -hmm. um, and then it became the, the gods spoke to our leaders, like Moses, mm -hmm. our Jesus. And then there was a time when God spoke to our ancestors, like Moses mm -hmm. and Jesus. And that's where we are now. Mm -hmm the God's book but but we almost take we we almost call that intuition like if we're getting this information we're, you know or these ideas we're assuming we're very clever but who knows so I'm not running around promoting this idea but I'm just saying yeah why not it's as good a hypothesis as any other so when you got Litwack to look at your dissertation in your book he was a, a relatively young man. We were talking earlier before when the recorder was off about how young, but certainly early twenties. Early and uh, we also mentioned Jonathan Gosling, who, when you first encountered him, was a relatively young person as an assistant professor. Not that young. It was much later. Um, I met Jonathan around nineteen, maybe ninety two, ninety three, something like that. He was probably in his thirties, I think. Okay. Um, but at the beginning of his career, though, right? He was an assistant um, professor. Well, he was on the faculty at Lancaster yeah. University. I'm not sure how much earlier he came there. No, but I he had done a number of things in yeah. life before, ran NGOs mm -hmm. and things. So, I mean, I, I was really struck by the fact that you were willing to trust your dissertation in your first book to such a young person, even if it was just technical editing. Um, do you think that one of the things that stood out about your career is that you have the ability to identify young talent and work with it? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I mean my doctoral students have been a very interesting group of people. Uh -huh. Maybe. Right now we have a doctoral student who has just turned 30. And we have him teaching executives um, as a doctoral student. Jeez. He's never done it before. Well, he might have done it in some ways, but... Mm -hmm. And he's a member of the committee that's, we're doing a MOOC now, mm -hmm. and he's part of the committee that's doing mm -hmm. this MOOC. 
And yesterday, yesterday, he came up with a question that I only remember once in my entire life this happening before, where somebody asked a question that actually startled me and sent me in another direction. And that happened yesterday, and maybe not as significant, but uh, the first time was when I was w w working on my book on different forms of organizing. I had mm -hmm. all these categories like different machine organizations and different things, uh, and combining all these, all, these, uh, all these elements of organizations. And by the way, I think that's my most coherent book, uh, The Structuring of Organizations, mm -hmm. or Structure in Fives is the short form. And, um, and uh, this doctoral student at NOL came up to me and said, are you playing jigsaw puzzle or Lego with these elements? And it just hit me. What a fabulous question, because I was playing jigsaw puzzle. Yeah. Putting together you know, like Chinese yeah. things where you put together four forms. And he's saying these could be building blocks. Huh. And it really set me on another course in that book. And yesterday we were designing our MOOC, which is about social initiatives and for groups. We're calling it a group, a group, group, MOOC, right. MOOC, MOOC. And um, so yesterday, we were outlining sort of the sessions we want to do and all that. <coughs> and we had this whiteboard and we, were, we had great big letters about, you know, mobilizing for action and funding and all these nice things. Mm -hmm. And Carlos, Peruvian guy, sitting writing at the corner of the blackboard, little tiny thing, that's saying a word, and he's writing, so we're talking. And then he says, suddenly, he says, well, we're a social initiative in developing this MOOC. And what if we were taking this MOOC? Would this be helping us to do what we're now doing? He said, we're six months into this and we're nowhere. Or at least we're just yeah. starting. And we want to do this in 12 weeks for other groups? And everybody stopped like, oh my God. <laughs> it's like, wow. <laughs> you know, and it just got us completely breakthrough thinking about we got to rethink how we're doing this, why we're doing this, what we're doing, totally, if we're going to get through. You know, most MOOCs, you just come in and film somebody giving nice lectures, and you put in some nice graphics, and that's the MOOC on elements of chemistry, you know, easy enough. You've done it mm -hmm. all your life. You're a great professor of chemistry, so they come in and film you. We're trying to engage the audience in groups, and we're sort of thinking, this isn't going to engage, all this stuff on the board is not going to engage the audience in groups. We better rethink this. So here's Carlos, you know, barely 30, uh, doctoral student, brilliant, <laughs> absolutely brilliant. So just because he's been <laughs> complimented by his professor in what's going to be a public forum, what's Carlos's last name? His last name? Carlos Rueda. Rueda. Rueda, okay. Okay. Um, and for the benefit of somebody who, who doesn't know and is using this interview, what is a MOOC? Oh. Massive online open, massive open online course. Okay. Right. And it's the, um, these things that have become very popular at Harvard and MIT and right. Stanford, where you open the course up to people around the world. So 150,000 sign up and 10,000 finish. And, yeah. Okay. So on your CV, your curriculum vita, you've got a category called other positions in which you, you list a variety of really impressive activities. Um, I'll just mention founding partner, coaching ourselves, 2007 to the present. But right at the bottom of that section of your CV, you write, and I'm quoting, I belong to no political party and never have. Yeah. What does that say about you? Well, Why is that there, first well, of all? What does that say about you? One of the reasons I put that in is the liberals once listed me as a party member. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was they the appropriated you. Um, does it mean I don't want to engage myself? I think I engage myself. Um, you know, there was this joke about this old lady in Maine who says, I never vote, it only encourages them. And, <laughs> and, uh, uh, I've heard that with different states plugged <laughs> in, but that was... <laughs> Maine is a good one. Yeah. Because <laughs> you sort of picture her up in the bush somewhere. But um, I, uh, I certainly don't relate to political parties. I, I, I'm not very keen on young people who join political party, unless they're very left-wing, because I think when you're young, you should be sowing your wild oats and not, <laughs> you know. But, but um, 
it's a kind of very establishment mentality mm-hmm. too, which I'm, I, if, if I'm nothing, I am consistently sort of anti-establishment. I, uh, although people would say I'm establishment, but, but I'm not keen. There's, there's a kind of an establishment mentality and there's a sort of non-establishment mentality. <coughs> Being Canadian, mm-hmm. particularly, I'm sort of not part of it, although there are plenty of Canadian establishment people, but Canadians in general are but sort they of all, underdogs. they all live in, in Ottawa, right? Well, so they're they, all in Ottawa. No. <laughs> and, to, and, and Bay Street in general. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Calgary. Um, especially Calgary these days with the oil business. But but I'm, uh, I, I'm, I think that's just a reflection that that I'm not a fan of uh, kind of conventional politics, which I think go nowhere for the most part these days. There was one other thing that struck me about your CV. Uh, you you have a really impressive list of accomplishments and publications. Um, you've got a category right at the top of your CV called background information, and there's a little bit of background about you, but then it says father of Susie and Lisa, grandfather of Laura, Thomas, and Myra. So, again, it's on your CV. So how important are your children and their children? Oh, we, my, I'm very close to my two daughters. Yeah. Both of them. Lisa's in London. Mm-hmm. Susie's here, but we see each other a lot. And there's, um, you know, over time, it gets warmer and warmer, I think. Uh, uh, so we're very close. Susie just started a doctoral program in uh, social work okay. uh, linked to psychiatry. Um, so they're, uh, we're very close. And the kids are wonderful. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, those three grandchildren are wonderful. They're, they're Susie's uh, kids. Did it change your life to become a grandfather? No, I, um, no, I, I probably not. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I wouldn't say it changed my life. I love it, but uh, I love the kids. But I wouldn't say it changed my life. So I, in the interest of full disclosure, will tell you that I talked to three people with your permission about sure. you: uh, Santa Rodriguez, Leslie Breitner, and William Litwack. Yeah, and they all had their own points of view, and they were all very helpful. But they all agreed on some of the qualities that have made you successful. And right at the top of everyone's list was focus, self-discipline, and hard work. Um, they said it differently, but, but they all said it. Um, Lidwack remembered that when your children were quite young, every morning you'd go in a room in your basement and put a sign on the door that said something like, don't disturb daddy. <laughs> um, he also said that you were the person who put in the work on research and on drafting and redrafting until you got your pros and your argument exactly the way you wanted them. So do you see Focus and discipline is hard, and hard work is part of your yeah, yeah, core sure. of who you are. I'm a Virgo. Um, Virgos are obsessive compulsive often. I once tried to learn to sail on a on a windsurf, and after <laughs> I climbed up the thirtieth time, mm-hmm. somebody said, "You're compulsive." And I said, no, I'm tenacious. <laughs> and, and we asked a friend what the difference was, and he said, the spelling. <laughs> <laughs> Did you really have a sign on the door saying, don't disturb daddy, or something like that? <laughs> I don't remember. What I do remember, <laughs> what I do remember, they were uh, in school by, you know, after a while anyway. But what I do remember is we rented a farm in the Perigord, a farmhouse in the Perigord region of France for many summers. And I have one wonderful picture of the kids appearing at the window which I took a picture Lisa's barely above the window still like that and Susie's about like this and then I took the same picture about three three years later and Lisa's up there <laughs> Susie's up there yeah, you know always uh, interrupting mm-hmm. Danny but uh, yeah. so each of the people I talked to um, and a lot of what I read also described you as intensely skeptical of received wisdom. Um, do you think of yourself that way? Well, you see, I don't think of myself as a contrarian because so much received w- wisdom is just nonsense. <laughs> but not all of them. I'll bite who gets to decide. <laughs> but I can, I can make the case. Oh, I just think that uh, the... I'll give you an example. Capitalism triumphed in 1989. Nonsense. Nonsense. Capitalism is a way of raising money for enterprises. It is, isn't it? There's a lot more to the American or any other economy than capitalism. Capitalism didn't triumph. A, a balanced society triumphed. So 
often I see everybody marching in one direction. I'm trying to think of other examples, but and I say they're all wrong. Every single one of them is wrong. And uh, I'm trying to think of maybe some examples will hit me, but where I mean, you could say nothing to do with me, but sort of Heil Hitler in Germany, you know, mm-hmm. kind of thing. But 67 percent of the Quebec population favors this dastardly legislation here. You've been reading about this with the uh, with the Charter of Values in Quebec. 67 percent of the population favors that, as if having a policeman with a Sikh turban on his head is going to do them great harm. I would like to know what proportion of 67 percent um, has ever met a Muslim. Yeah. Um, now that's not going against received wisdom because anybody, thinking people in Quebec and elsewhere are totally opposed to this. I'm not, I'm in the mainstream, not of the 67 percent. But of the thinking people. But of the thinking people in Quebec. But So it's not a good example, but um, I'm trying to think because there's so many, so often people will jump on the bandwagon in the U.S. about something. Um, it, some things will occur to me. But where you see, um, well, again, I was, was hardly alone, but it occurred to me very early that, that you know, in terms of the, uh, the um, well, uh, one bandwagon effect was certainly the Iraq war or even the New York Times and Washington Post would get aboard that bandwagon and and it seemed pretty obvious uh, it wasn't obvious that they had or didn't have nuclear weapons but it was certainly it was certainly there for the seeing that the new American century have you ever looked at that document yeah. signed by Rove and uh, yeah. all that whole gang I mean they were talking about going after Iraq years before they were obsessed with 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 attacking Iraq. It was just on the agenda, nothing to do with it. I had a question I was going to ask you about that, and I'm going to pull it up right now, which yeah. is why I turned the pages. Um, March 20th, 2003, the United States under President George W. Bush invaded Iraq. February 20, 2003, you published an article in the Toronto Globe and Mail, which for Americans and others listening is like Canada's newspaper, uh, and the article was titled, But Mr. Bush, Why Now? You speculated on the likely cost of such a war, including more terrorism, political instability, economic depression, and wholesale death. And I'm going to read a line from this because I think it's so cool and because I want I, I don't even listen. remember that. Well, well, then I'll refresh your memory is, along is that on, is that on my list of, of articles, by the way? Uh, no. I, I, cool, I think I, I forgot. I searched until I found this. Uh, I'm going to put that on because uh, I think I left it out. I'll, I'll give you this. It's, okay. it's on your CV under Other. But oh. you, you, you concluded, he says, choose any or all of the above, but add in a good dose of ideological groupthink, that mindless collective drive toward a flawed course of action. This happened before in America, most notably in the 1960s, when the greatest brain trust ever put together an administration that couldn't distinguish between a nationalist movement from a communist one. Groupthink also occurred in the 1950s when a paranoid senator named Joe McCarthy managed to take control of the American political agenda for a time. Then, too, it was communism, or was it? Now it's terrorism, or is it? And so, no, oh, that's well written, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, this is lovely. I mean, I, yeah. I, looked, yeah, I can't but believe I, I wrote that. <laughs> but you, you just got your name on it. Um, but the, I'm wondering if you could, how, how do you assess ideological groupthink in terms of leadership and management? Oh yeah, can you talk Shareholder about that? Shareholder value. Can you, can you talk about that a bit? That's a perfect example. Yeah. It was nonsense from the first day. Absolute nonsense, and it became such a cult. The idea that companies exist for day traders, for example, who buy in the morning and sell in the afternoon. An employee who's there for 25 years doesn't count, but a day trader owns the company. Uh-huh. Well, obviously, they own the company the way ownership is defined, but to exclude everybody else, you know, we, we did a, an article called Beyond Selfishness. Uh-huh. Um, with Bob Simons, who used to be one of my doctoral students, he's chaired in accounting at Harvard, mm-hmm. and another guy, Kunal Basu, and we talked about um, two statements from the Business Roundtable, the Business Roundtable of the mm-hmm. most prominent American chief executives, and the first statement was maybe 81 or 82, 
Um, and it basically said the corporation exists for various stakeholders. Then comes this new statement, I think in 87, or maybe later, whenever it was, that said, um, that said um, that not only did the corporation only exist for the shareholders, but if it existed for any other people, management would have no basis for making decisions about the allocation of resources. And I said, yeah, that's true, no basis except judgment. What these people are saying <laughs> is there's no more judgment in, in right. the executive suites of the American corporations. Now, Jack Welch is on record recent years as saying that shareholder value is the dumbest idea ever. But Jack Welch, as I understand it, not only was a member of that business roundtable group, but championed that statement. Mm -hmm. He, of course, doesn't have to look back or apologize or anything. He just, you know, he changed his mind, so he's writing new things now. Here, can you trust him with the new ones if you couldn't trust them with the old ones? Um, uh, Michael Jensen, who has found truth and, mm -hmm. and everything, and is a nice guy who really does care, seems to care, mm -hmm. but he wrote a piece uh, on shareholder value, and he's probably more responsible for shareholder value than anybody else. And after the damage was done, he reneges. Um, saying that, uh, and by the way, let me say something about uh, the, the finance guy in the U.S. in a minute, but, but uh, in that piece, they tell a story, Jensen and Meckling article, and they tell a story about George Bernard Shaw on a boat crossing the ocean and saying to this famous actress, would you sleep with me for a million dollars? And she said, of course. And he said, well, how about ten dollars? And you know the story. And she said, uh, who do you think I am? And he said, we've determined that. We're haggling about the price. <laughs> and they follow that up with a statement, something like, like it or not, we all have our price. In other words, this was the most, mm -hmm. Jensen taught the most popular elective course at Harvard for years. He was teaching students that everybody is a whore. That's what he was teaching students. Mm -hmm. This is, Skilling was in, I'm sure Skilling was in that class. Everybody's a whore. That's and what they were doing. The skilling of Enron. Skilling of Enron. Yeah. So, now what's his name? What's the name of the guy who read, ran the Fed, the most famous American economist? Um, um, he's retired now. But I know. Um, he was interviewed on radio yesterday at CBC. He's okay. just come out with a new book. Okay, well, for right now, we'll say that he was the former head of the Fed because it's, r it's rattling around on the edge of my brain here. But I with a G, a Greenwald or Green, Greenspan? Greenspan, Alan Greenspan, Greenspan, yes. So he's discovered his mistake. And his mistake sounds like something really obscure, like, I forget, he, he, he describes it in a weird way. And I'm thinking, that's not your mistake. Your mistake is that you were captured by a dogma and weren't smart enough to see past your dogma, your Chicago economic dogma. That's your mistake. Your mistake was not a mistake. Your mistake was a character flaw. I think there's a difference between mistakes and flaws. I, I once rang the doorbell of a friend's house. We were playing tennis. We played tennis often. He opens the doorbell. It's one of these events where it sticks in your mind because you can see it. I can see the doorstep. He opens the door with his tennis rack and all dressed, ready to go. And he said, did you hear that Alec shot himself last night? Killed himself. Alec was a very dear friend of mine when I was young. And he couldn't understand why I wouldn't play tennis that day. And I never argued with him. I never said anything to him. I never saw him again, ever. No vendetta. That wasn't a mistake. That was a character flaw. Greenspan did not make a mistake. Greenspan had the character flaw that characterizes Milton Friedman and the rest of that gang who have been dragging us into this nonsense because they're absolutely captured by a narrow-minded dogma that is extremely destructive. And, and Greenspan said Can it... Can you articulate that narrow-minded dogma that's extremely yeah. destructive? Straight out of my pamphlet. Greed is good. Markets are... Uh, greed is good, markets are sacrosanct, property is sacred, and governments are suspect. Mm -hmm. That's the narrow-minded dogma. And I have the habit right, it's right, it's <laughs> one of the key things in my pamphlet. 
And then I say, as one view of human nature, that makes sense, some sense. As the view of human nature, it's nonsense. For them, it was the view. He couldn't see past it. Mm -hmm. And he made a statement. I just picked it up peripherally because I was turning it off. I was doing something else. It was on the radio. About everybody's driven by, he didn't say a dogma. He said a worldview or something Mm -hmm. like that. No. No. No, intelligent people are able to say, wait a minute, maybe it's wrong. And he couldn't see. He was blind. And so this great hero, this is another example of how everybody's marching one way. And, uh, and, uh, so the marching, marching takes another. place when dogma triumphs over intelligence? Yeah, over thinking. Yeah. yeah. Over thinking, I would say, yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you a, a question. <laughs> this is going to work or it isn't, but part, it's sort of aimed at, you know, where do ideas come from? And everyone that I talked to, one of the, the, the things that was at the top of the list when they mentioned you was curiosity. And Litwack told me, he said that he said that your first wife was a potter, and she had a considerable reputation as a potter, and she had a studio in your home. And he said that her work as a craftsperson influenced one of your very best all-time articles called Crafting Strategy, yeah. Harvard Business Review, 1987. And he added that, and I'll add, that Crafting Strategy is 12th on your all-time citation list, which is pretty impressive. Um, 1987, you won the McKinsey Prize, uh, second best article in Business Review, which I assume was for crafting strategy. Yeah, yeah. So, for the benefit again of people who are going to listen to this or look at the transcript, I'm going to read like a line from Crafting Strategies. And you wrote, Imagine someone planning strategy. What likely springs to mind is an image of orderly thinking, a senior manager, a group of them sitting in an office formulating courses of action that everyone else will implement on schedule. The keynote is ra- reason, rational control, the systematic analysis of competitors and markets, of company strengths and weaknesses. The combination of these analyses produces clear, explicit, full-blown strategies. Now imagine someone crafting strategy, a wholly different image results. So long setup for a short question is, how did the craftsperson, that is your wife, the potter, influence your thinking in crafting strategy? How did you connect the dots? <laughs> yeah, uh, I, d- I think I do a lot of connecting of dots, actually. It's sort of something I do. Um, you know, the most... The thing that influenced me most was not her, but a colleague of her in Australia who was a very famous potter. Mm-hmm. I think, I don't know if that's... I think it might be mentioned in that article. And somebody asked him, somebody wanted to study him, like I study managers. Yeah. And they said that they were going to study him and watch him and learn how he, he does his pottery. And he claimed that was the dumbest idea he ever heard. And he said, he proposed the following. He said, I'll make a thousand pots and you watch how the pots evolve over these thousand pots. And then you'll learn what I'm doing. I thought, that's fabulous. Like, it evolves. Right. Um, <laughs> and, and strategies evolve kind of like that. The funniest thing is, he told my wife, don't tell anybody somebody will steal the idea. <laughs> <laughs> somebody did. <laughs> no, but steal it in the sense of making a thousand pots. Right, right, right. right. Stole the idea. <laughs> but, uh, but, but about the pots. So, uh, that's true, I did steal it. So, so um, um, you know, that... So I think that's kind of the link in a way that, it, that when you sit down and you're looking at the wheel, and, and he, that's an extremely creative person. No, she's manic, not for, I don't know, she, she's not well, but hasn't well for a long, long time. But extremely creative person. And, and so she'll start to do something and it'll break and go all over the place. And next thing you know, she's got some lovely shape that came out of there. And basically, a lot of great things are serendipitous. I, I like to talk about two kinds of creativity. She had, she had this kind of spectacular creativity, the kind of, the kind of Picasso Guernica kind of mm-hmm. creativity. Or, my favorite example is, uh, is the violin is Tchaikovsky's violin concerto. How anybody could do that is beyond me. Just a level of creativity that is spectacular. The creativity that probably has more influence in the world 
is very ordinary. Uh, a guy is doing research in a laboratory and he's got these samples of bacteria and some mold gets into a cup of them and he said, I, I got to throw it out. And then he said, well, wait a minute, if the mold is killing the bacteria, maybe we could use that to kill bacteria in the body. And this is the most astounding medical discovery of the 20th century, penicillin and yeah. antibiotics and so Is that like unbelievably creative? He just switched things. Mm -hmm. All he did was switch it around. Uh, that, uh, and that's it's serendipitous in a way, it's serendipitous that the mold got in, because we might not, if the mold did, he found 31 footnotes in other articles that said mold got in to the bacteria and I had to throw samples away. And that was, he was saying, Fleming was saying, any one of those people could have done right. what I did, they just didn't see it. And, and, um, and, you know, jokes are like this little flipping around. Um, I want to die, it's not my joke, I want to die like my grandfather died, quietly, in his sleep. Not like those other people in the car who died yelling and screaming. <laughs> okay? Just flipping it around. You've got this image of grandfather in, be in bed, and of course he's driving the car. I, I, I came up with a little joke yesterday I thought was kind of cute because I was feeling under the weather, and I said, you know, one astronaut says the other astronaut, as, uh, as they land on the ground, uh, I'm so glad that we're I'm so glad that we're back. we're under the weather. No, thank God we're under the weather. <laughs> so, so but, these are just flipping things around. But right? you know, maybe real creativity is that the one out of twenty-seven people who realized not to throw them all away. Yeah, but right. what I mean is, it's not of the order of writing the violin concerto, Tchaikovsky's violin yeah. concerto, which is an amazing synthesis of sounds and the hundred pieces in the orchestra, whatever it was in those days, and just amazing. So if you look at this tremendous body of work that you produce, is that like the concerto? This amazing synthesis? Well, I don't want to compare myself to the concerto. <laughs> I know I did that. <laughs> I, I like... Uh, <laughs> you can just run with it. I don't mind if you do. Um, I, um, yeah, maybe. Maybe the structuring of organizations was kind of like that. Yeah, maybe it's just a hundred little things all combined, a hundred little switches all combined, um, could be. So when I talked to, to Bill Litwack, he, he reminded me, or he, he told me that he'd introduced you in his home city of Bangalore, India. When you were there, he, was, he provided an introduction, and he was kind enough to give me a copy, so I, I had a chance to read it, in which he mm -hmm. talked about you as a cross-country skier in Canada, and I'm going to read a line. He said, most people who cross-country ski do it on prepared trails that are carefully maintained and groomed, but not Henry. He insists on what is called bushwhacking, going off trails straight into the snow, and in Canada it's sometimes deep snow, and breaking his own trails. Could there be more of a perfect image for how he's approached his research and writing? So, I mean, I'll, I'll tell them, say in the interest of full disclosure, that I did some bushwhacking in the Bitterroot Mountains of Montana, so I, I know all what it involves, but is he right? Is that a perfect image for yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe your so research and writing? Yeah, probably. I, um, the way it started was I was skiing with a friend, and we were going on the trail beside a lake, and I said, ah, let's just go on the lake. It's nicer to go on the lake. So we cut out, we went along the lake. And then when we came to the end of the lake, we were going to join back of the trail. And then we looked at the map and we said, well, you know what? This trail goes off like this, but there's another trail in the woods that's going like this. Let's, let's go to that trail. So we went and connected to the other trail. And after that, we were off. We were off trails totally. We were totally off trails. Every Saturday, um, I can, um, a, um, a uh, compass and a topographical map, and off we went. There were no GPS in those days. And off we went and um, we just explored and uh, we loved it we absolutely loved it. and I, I that is absolutely in my bones to do that kind of thing so you would break and trail as a, as a scholar mm -hmm. as a scholar are you figuratively breaking trail yeah I guess so I mean yeah. certainly with the IMPM and those mm -hmm. new programs yeah yeah I think uh, I, I've done a lot of that now I write short stories and I wrote one called Going Off Track with Frank, mm -hmm. which if you want to see is about that experience. It's about everything I did with Frank, but it's yeah. basically about our bushwhacking. Um, I will. You've traveled all over the world, cities all over the world, and I understand from, from talking to Mr. Litwack that you don't like museums. 
<laughs> why is that? Is that true and why? Uh, it's probably a little less true than when I used to articulate a little bill. I, I, I remember once going to the Musée d'Orsay in, in Paris and, and saying the most beautiful thing in the Musée d'Orsay is the Musée itself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the only thing worth going to see is the museum itself. I've since been to the Hermitage in, in St. Petersburg and because I love uh, Van Gogh. Mm -hmm. We certainly like to see it, but it's dead. It's dead. Mm -hmm. I think art should be live. You go to Mexico City, it's all over the yeah. murals, all over the walls. Art shouldn't be hidden Diego away. Diego Rivera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. shouldn't just hide all this art in museums. It should be living. So in that sense, it's a bit boring. Now there's this glass exhibition. You know about that? I think it's finished now, but... Yeah. Have you seen that? This um, American guy from uh, Seattle? Yeah, Seattle. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Have you seen his? I've seen his work, yes. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that was in a museum. It was amazing. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Um, I also understand that when you travel to various cities, that you, at least you used to like to get on a bicycle and ride around. Yeah, I bicycled. I've done overnight bicycling, like three, four days or more in 15 different countries, sometimes by myself. Three days in Japan by myself. I crossed France. I did two 800-kilometer trips in France, uh, one by myself, one north-south, one east-west. Um, Why? What, what, what attraction? I love bicycling. It's just the right speed. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the perfect speed. It's exercise. And yet it's leisure, in the sense you don't have to go fast. I, I never like these handlebars. I want to sit up there and look around. Um, it's wonderful. Uh, and the speed, you know, if you're walking, I love to hike. I've done all hike, tons of hiking. I've climbed Mont Blanc once, uh, but I love to uh, hike to uh, bicycle. Mm -hmm. Because hiking, unless you're in a spectacular area like the Lake District or the Alps or something, it's slow, you know, from city to city. And cars, you just whiz by, you don't mm -hmm. see anything. You know, you see it and it's gone. A bicycle is just the perfect speed for seeing things. You're getting exercise, it's wonderful. I love bicycle. So, when you tell me that you didn't like museums because the stuff in there is dead, and you enjoyed riding a bicycle because of the pace and the experience that it gives you, does that, those points of view in any way connect to Henry Mintzberg, the scholar, oh, to, researcher. To. <laughs> to, and I can focus that, but I just let me see what, what, what you can do. Well, I think observation and the exploring in the research is a bit like the bicycling. Um, the museum, you know, the, nature, the structuring of organizations was based on published material for the most part, mm -hmm. which is sort of like going into the archives. Um, I think maybe it's the show of it. I, I, I'm not big on spectacles. I'm not big on uh, theater. I don't mean theater, theater. Actually, I like movies much more than mm -hmm. theater. But, but this, the, um, I don't like people to make a fuss about me. Um, so um, I tend to sort of, uh, I, I don't look for the limelight. I mean, I'm doing today, but, you know, I was honored to do it. I well, you were invited <laughs> into the limelight, yeah, too. Yeah, so it was yeah, I don't go looking <laughs> for it. But um, so I guess, yeah, I'd have to think about that. We talked at the beginning when we were first chatting about your Canadian perspective um, and, and how that influences uh, the way you look at the world and the kind of scholarship that you've done. And I want to do a follow-up on that. And you live for most of your adult life in French-speaking Quebec. And you told me, I don't remember if we had a recorder on or not, that you're fluent in French. Um, tensions between the Francophone Catholic part of Canada and Quebec and the Anglophone Protestant parts of the rest of the country are an important theme in Canadian history. Um, there was an indigenous terrorist movement here in the 60s and 70s. 
uh, René Levesque and the Parti Québécois, unsuccessful referendum in 1980. We've got the Meech Lake Accord, Accord in 1987, uh, which sort of broke apart, you know, when some, some of the provinces uh, uh, didn't approve it. The 1995 separatists lost another referendum in Quebec. So I'm wondering if living in this area where there's been this tension between Francophone and Anglophone Canada has had any impact on you as you develop, particularly thinking in terms of management, strategy, leadership? No, I doubt it. Um, the conflict in Canada, unlike Belgium and lots of Ireland, Northern Ireland and many other countries, is rarely personal. It's more on the plane of communities and, and cultures. Uh, French Canadian people are among the friendliest, warmest people I know anywhere, mm -hmm. much like the Irish, mm -hmm. not the Northern Irish, the, the Republic Irish. Um, they're among the nicest, warmest people I've ever met. Uh, they're, they're very interbred with French Canadians, say, because they were both poor Catholics, so they could intermarry. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I've never experienced uh, a lot of tension between Francophones and Anglophones, like personal tension on the street. I, you know, sure, things happen. They happen in any society. Uh, but you don't get the kind of things you see in Northern Ireland or saw in Northern Ireland or, or that you see in Belgium. You know, real kind of hatred. Um, I don't think it's been characterized by that. So in that sense, it's never felt like a... There have been violence. There's been violence occasionally, but actually remarkably little, um, if you think about independence movements. So there's never been that kind of... There's, there's this financial threat. There's this threat of sort of having to uproot, uh, or, you know, the, uh, but there's not, the, there's not this threat of personal safety. 1995 referendum was remarkably close. Um, um, tenth of the, yeah. a few tenths of a percent. Did, did that represent, I don't know, had it been successful, do you think that it would have transformed this place in hmm. ways that might have been difficult to adjust to? Well, investment did, sure. Uh, investment, you said? No, and would it have transformed this place in ways that would have been difficult to adjust to? I mean... Yeah, uh, I think so, in a way, because... You know, Montrealists are here because it's such an eclectic place. This sends out a signal, basically saying it's for certain people and not for other people, and regardless of what they say, that's the case. Um, it could have, uh, it, nobody's particularly written about this, but it could have led to dire consequences because by cutting off the eastern provinces, you create a kind of Bangladesh, Pakistan situation. And, um, and and I would think the the maritime provinces would almost have had to go their own way. Then you have a Canada that consists of Ontario and the West, with a majority of voters in Ontario. That wouldn't be stable either. Mm -hmm. So you would have a breakup. I think every which way you'd have a West, or maybe even a British Columbia and the Prairies, or, or maybe an Alberta by itself. You'd have an East. You'd have an Ontario. It would have been dire, I think. Not not just what happens in Quebec, but just that split would have been dire, I think. Um, and and that might have been, and, and that could have led to to violence. And uh, uh, so so that could have made things go really really bad. Did you ever write about that? Did I write about that? Yeah, I wrote a book for the second referendum. It's mm -hmm. the fastest thing I ever did. <laughs> because I thought if I could influence a few votes, it's called The Canadian Condition. Mm -hmm. Santa can give you a copy. And we got lots of copies. <laughs> it actually <laughs> sold about 6,000 copies, which wasn't bad. It's a little paperback, um, sort of sort of expressing a point of view about uh, you know, this great battle between the Francophones and the Anglophones is a battle between significantly Celtic Anglophones, Irish and Scottish, and significantly Celtic French, who come significantly from Normandy and Brittany. <laughs> and, and in fact, the most famous dishes in Quebec are actually dishes from the other side of the uh, 
English Canal of the uh, of the canal. The uh, what's it called? The English Canal. Nobody called. Oh, it. the English Channel. English Channel. Yeah. Um, so uh, I wrote a constitution that I said, if it's going to be taken seriously, it has to be in one page. <laughs> and I had dinner that night of the referendum with a very famous Quebec woman and her husband, and. Um, so I pre she's French Canadian, and I took it. I wrote it in the morning. I said this is serious because I wrote it this morning, and and I put it with a, in a blue package with a red ribbon, and said how can I bring you chocolate or wine? This her husband is the conductor of the Montreal Symphony, Charles mm -hmm. Dutoit, very famous. Guy. And she's she's married to Kravis now, mm -hmm. KKR. She's so I I wasn't going to bring chocolates or a bottle <laughs> of wine, so I brought a constitution. So and then I published it in this little book. I'm going to ask you one more question about yourself and then switch topics completely in the time we have left. But um, Santa Rodriguez told me that you, when you were working, that you scribble ideas on little pieces of paper and shove them in your pockets. Yeah. And that you take them home and put them in stacks and then eventually you reorganize the little pieces of paper. I mean, is that true? And yeah, what does true. that say about thousands, uh, thousands, your creative process? Thousands and thousands <laughs> of little pieces of paper. I got thousands of little pieces of paper. Um, I guess it's just, well, it's just a question of coding. It's a question of having single ideas, and particular ideas, and then coding them all to get them into some kind of structure. Yeah. Um, th this is written up a bit in the piece called uh, uh, Developing Theory about the Development yeah. of Theory. You can see it. That's, that's, I love that piece. That's the most playful thing I've ever written. Um, I'm going to, we have a little bit of time left. I'm going to switch and, and talk to you about leadership because we're here on behalf of the International Leadership Association. And the first question I want to ask you is, do you think of yourself as a leader? No, I mean, no. Um, maybe a thought leader, but I mean, I'm not, I've never particularly strived for leadership positions. Um, so I'm not a leader in that conventional sense. Now, thinkers are leaders if people choose to follow their thoughts. So they become leaders by the attribution of what they've written to things that people want to think about. So in that sense, sure, any article that becomes popular leads mm -hmm. if it says new things. So in that sense, yeah. Uh, but not in the sense of... And, and I think we, we certainly set out to lead in the uh, this changing a management education, yeah. redefining a management education. That was certainly, you certainly took the lead in trying to sort of make a breakthrough and change that around. And what, what did you hope the nature of that breakthrough would be? <laughs> it's not happening. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, they say that Karl Marx learned how to ride a horse so he could lead the revolution. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know if it's true either. I doubt it, but I don't know. <laughs> it's uh, apocryphal. But, but um, I, it was my hope. It seemed to me obvious, and still seems to me obvious, that MBA programs are geared for people going into analytical positions like marketing research or financial analysis, and that we're not training managers, and we need programs to train and help develop managers. And that means taking people who are managers and giving them a chance to reflect on their own experience and learn from each other. And uh, that's what uh, uh, that's what we hope would catch fire and go all over the place. Okay, I'm going to hit pause on this for a minute and see who's at the door. Um, finish up the next time I talk to you. So let me just make sure this is on. All right. Yeah, we are. So, um, so... Let's do this, and we'll then we'll and I'll I'll just leave it hanging until the next time I get a chance to talk to you, and that is. Here are actually two questions. The first one is, how do you define leadership? How do you know it when you see it? I think. I'll tell you how I don't define leadership. That will work too. As externally, externally determined, that 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 senior people decide who are young leaders. I, I hate that term, young leaders, because they have. To, uh, leadership is exhibited by people wanting to follow someone and doing something. And so it's the led who determine leadership, not the superior, not the superiors. 
So you could say leadership is defined as characteristics that make people want to follow someone, going someone. Such as? Gandhi? No, I mean characteristics. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Everything from Gandhi to Hitler. I yeah, mean, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's um, something compelling about a vision or, okay. or uh, you know, or a direction, but also a belief that that person can actually make it happen. So you talk about voting with your feet. Nobody voted with his feet the way Gandhi did. Literally with his feet, with the salt march and all that. So, is leadership practiced or earned? Practiced or? Earned. Both. Yeah. But it's certainly earned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of people running around thumping their chests, calling themselves leaders who, who are. Look, I, I'm on record as saying that any, any chief executive who accepts to be paid several hundred times as much as the workers is not a leader. That means the Fortune I read that 500 several places. <laughs> no, Fortune 500 has no leaders, mm -hmm. or almost no leaders. Okay, um, I'm gonna. Here's an ex another okay. example of where everybody's out of step. Uh, how could all these chief executives? How could almost none of them step back and say, "What effect is my salary having on this organization?" How could almost none of them? step back and say, I, I wrote, the first time I published about this was in the Financial Times where I wrote a letter as if from a chief executive to the board saying, how can you do this to me? How, how, uh, if you choose to pay me this way, if you choose to single me out this way, how can I possibly think long term if you're, if you're paying me for, in bonuses and how can I possibly build teamwork that I'm busy talking about when you want to pay me this way? Please cut my salary. Of course, they weren't <laughs> breaking down the doors. But you'd think a few of them would sort of step back and say, what am I here for? Mm -hmm. Like, Am I here to s demonstrate that mine is bigger than everybody else's? Or am I here to lead this company in the best way I possibly can? And, and the first signal I'm sending out is how I'm being paid. I'm going to re respect the opportunity for you to have a little downtime before your your next session yeah, so and we will I will turn these recorders off and this should be the main recorder so we should be live okay. and as I said when the recorders off I'm going to read a short statement just to to say who I am and who you are and why we're here and then I'm going to ask your permission and then we'll go ahead with the interview. So today is July 7, 2014. My name is Philip Scarpino, professor of history at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, and director of oral history for the Tobias Center for Leadership Excellence. I have the privilege to be interviewing Dr. Henry Mintzberg in his office on the campus of McGill University, Montreal, Canada. I'm conducting this interview on behalf of the International Leadership Association and the Tobias Center for Leadership Excellence. This is the second interview with Dr. Minsberg, the first one having taken place on October 30, 2013. There's a brief biography of Dr. Minsberg at the start of the first interview, and a more extended one will accompany the audio recordings and transcripts when they're deposited with the IEPUI Special Collections and Archives, as well as the Tobias Center and the International Leadership Association. So I'll simply note that Dr. Minsberg is the Claghorn Professor of Management Studies at McGill University, Montreal, Canada. He's published about 160 scholarly articles and 16 books with a focus on organization, strategy, management, and leadership. And of course, he's a winner of a Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Leadership Association. So I'd like to ask your permission to record this interview, to transcribe the interview, and then to deposit the recording in the transcription with the IUPUI Special Collections and Archives, the International Leadership Association, and the Tobias Center, which may include them posting all or parts of these to their websites. Okay, so I'm Henry Mintzberg, and I'm in agreement with all that. Thank you. So just in case somebody jumps into the middle here at the end of our first session, uh, I had begun to talk to you about leadership, um, and I'd asked you if you thought of yourself as a mentor and if you considered yourself to be a leader, and I wanna, I'm going to follow up and talk to you about leadership. But first I want to ask a question that was actually prompted when I, when I re-listened to our first uh, interview. Well, before I do that, I'm going to do something. I, 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 sat, I sat in your office looking at the lovely view here in Mont Royal, and uh, I, it's always interesting to see what people have in their offices. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not going you know, to give away your, your secrets, but I do notice that one of the themes in here 
is pieces of wood chewed by beavers. Mm. And you have on the wall here a, a rather sculptural looking piece. It looks like it's poplar or aspen. It's been chewed on branches and on the ends by beavers. And I'm, I'm just wondering yeah, what attracted you to beavers that you decorated your wall with their I cuttings. Don't, I don't. I suspect it's not poplar. It might be. I think it's probably uh, uh, maple. Okay, I was just guessing. Uh, at the, but I'm not yeah. sure. Somebody came up to the house who did cartoons and. And they and he did one that shows a beaver swimming, another beaver next to him, the other beaver saying, "I thought we decided to go with maple." <laughs> I mean, this is a charming piece. I mean, the yeah, beaver did a good job. So. And it's on. It's actually on minceburg.org mm -hmm. slash beaver, uh, and it's a. I think it's the last photograph on there. It was yeah. taken on the wall, actually. Yeah, yeah I just uh, we have a house in the country. We just came back from there yesterday. It's called La Castor, which means beaver lake beaver, in yeah. French. And uh, and uh, a lot of my pieces like that one were picked up in that lake. And I don't take what the beavers use. I take what they leave behind. Mm -hmm. But what they use is always straight because they take everything off. Mm -hmm. So it's not interesting anyway. Uh, but I take what they leave behind. This was just floating in the water. Good. Yeah, and I got dozens of them. Is there anything that you find particularly fascinating about beavers? I, it's not so much beavers. Well, beavers are fascinating because yeah. they're such engineers and they're the symbol of Canada because mm -hmm. they're the ultimate engineers in nature, I mean mm -hmm. of non-human ones. Although the beaver, the Hoover, <laughs> the Hoover Dam mm -hmm. claims to have gotten the idea for arching the dam, yeah. which obviously structurally is much stronger, from beavers. And beavers will arch their dams, right. and beavers will also build series of dams if the water is if there's too much yeah. force in the water. I've also seen a beaver dam that's been as long as I think 400 feet. Although yeah. somewhere in the Northwest Territories, there's one that goes for kilometers apparently. They're pretty amazing. Anyway, I was just struck by that, and I actually have seen the pictures on your website, but yeah. seeing it in the in the, in it's the flesh, beautiful. so to speak, is yeah, that one. That one's absolutely beautiful. I I just. You know, it's not it's not like driftwood. It's worked. It's not worked intentionally. Right. I mean, it's worked intentionally, but not for artistic purposes. I have a big argument with a friend who's kind of snobby and says it's not art. So I say, okay, so it's craft. <laughs> <laughs> art is in the eye of the beholder. Yeah. Um, all right, so on, on, on to a more serious subject. I just couldn't resist asking you about that. Um, mm -hmm. Nothing's more serious than that. The topic that I want to bring up is balance or balanced society, and this will, I think, allow us to, to make some connections to your recent interests in a minute. But I'm going to set this question up in case somebody just jumped into the middle and hasn't listened to the first interview. That twice during our first recording session, you referred to the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989. As most people know, November 9, 1989, German people tore down the Berlin Wall, one of the most powerful symbols of the Cold War, and that act symbolically marked the collapse of the Soviet Union. But you noted the widespread interpretation of tearing down the Berlin Wall uh, and the end of the Soviet Union as the end of capitalism, or the triumph of capitalism, sorry. And your response. A little difference. Yeah. yeah it might, it <laughs> the might triumph. Still, it might still prove to be the end. <laughs> well, we're gonna, you're going to get to that one, but. Um, but your response to this interpretation as the triumph of capitalism was nonsense, and, and that's a quote from you. You said capitalism didn't triumph, a balanced uh, society triumph. So I'm wondering if you could explain what you meant when you said capitalism didn't triumph, a balanced society triumph. Well, the, the, the Eastern European countries collapsed largely under their own weight. They were certainly pushed by the United States and by Western countries, but, but they, it, they collapsed under their own weight. They were just so completely out of whack. Uh, and totally out of balance in, in, in the sense that their, uh, their private sectors were very weak, their plural sectors, their community sectors, community organizations were extremely weak because they wouldn't allow uh, them to grow. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, the first crack in, in that re those regimes really happened in Poland yeah. thanks to the survival of two plural sector, community sector organizations, the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. um, and as a result, the Sol Solidarity Union yeah. was able to get a foothold. Um, and, uh, and so they were completely out of balance. We were, in fact, rather in balance at that point. Um, and in fact, you could argue that from 1945 to 1989, the U.S. experienced the greatest 
period of development, not only economic, but political and social, in the history of any country ever. I think that could be argued. The U.S. was in balance, or relatively speaking, mm -hmm. was in balance. There were strong welfare programs. Uh, the Reagan was starting to undermine those, but that only came in the last few years. Right. There were very strong welfare programs through the through you know uh, under uh, under Johnson and so Great on. Society and, and there was yeah. yeah, and there was very strong plural sector, um, and uh, um, so the U.S. was very balanced at that point, and if. If this was a contest between the two, and I, I'm not sure it's totally fair to say that because, as I said, I think the East collapsed under its own weight, not not mm -hmm. because it was pushed, although that helped. Um, if this was a balance between the two, then it was a. If this was a, a battle between the two, then it was a battle between countries that were balanced and countries that were imbalanced, and and the misinterpretation of that has been throwing us out of balance ever since. So assuming that you're right. And the collapse of the Soviet Union represented a triumph of balanced society. How come? How do, why do you think so many smart people got it wrong? Well, that wasn't the first time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it won't be the last time. No. What about all the smart people who went to Iraq? Yeah, well, yes. uh, what about what about all the smart? people like McNamara who mm -hmm. were responsible for the Vietnam War and that includes Kennedy by the way who voluntarily escalated mm -hmm. uh, and what about all the smart people around Kennedy considered the greatest brain trust just ever and says maybe Russo I don't know but mm -hmm. but considered amazing brain trust how, how come they all got it wrong because they were blinded mm -hmm. you know the one thing the US hasn't come to grips with because Iraq and maybe Afghanistan too are, are just simply another example of the same phenomenon the US has never faced has never faced the reason why it did that and it continues to do it and it, in Iraq it did exactly the same thing with not as disastrous a result but pretty disastrous in loss of lives mm -hmm. um, and 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 it's this kind of enemy and the US always seems to need an enemy and if they if one goes away <laughs> find another one and um, you know, there's no question that um, about what Bin Laden did in uh, in 9/11, but did that justify what the U.S. did in Iraq? Not at all. Not even remotely. Mm -hmm. So, do smart people can smart people be stupid? Yes, very often, especially when they don't think for themselves. I'm just doing a piece now, Fuki. Because what goes with this is Fukiana's. Fukuyama's piece called The End of End History, History yeah. and he just wrote, he just revisited 25 years later and, and said, well, he was right after all. Well, he's blind. Um, but that went with it too, and I'm just writing a rejoinder to that, which I'm calling The End of Thinking. Hmm. Um, so so why, why was Fukuyama wrong? Why was, because he was blind, hmm. because he, 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 they were so caught up in this victory of, of, you know, in this Cold War, in this victory of all things good. Uh, Fukuyama writes, uh, he calls it liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. Liberal democracy won. Um, well, there are a lot of people in the world who don't see liberal democracy as either as liberal or as democratic mm -hmm. as some other people see it. Um, and that's part of the blindness. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when people are out in the streets, there's, nobody is looking at the Ukraine now, for example, and saying, um, well, why are these people in the Russian-speaking East so upset? Like, it's not just us and them. It's not right. just the good guys and the bad guys, although Putin's not a good guy in my books. But, but there's also reasons. So what, what people aren't reporting much of is that the first thing the new, after they brought down their president, who was elected, the first thing they did was, was uh, for, you know, uh, take away the... Uh, the rights of Russian speaking, I, uh, I'm, I'm putting it badly, uh, denied Russia as a, as a language of the Ukraine. Well, no kidding, they were upset. No mm -hmm. kidding. Nobody's reporting that. Nobody, they reported it initially, but nobody's discussing it. It's, it's all sort of us and them. We're the good guys, they're the bad guys. So do you think that part of the problem is the way Americans, that is, people from the United States, view the world? It's a, it's a sort of major part of the problem. I mean, I quote Soros and Friedman, uh, Tom Friedman from yeah. the New York Times, uh, uh, in my pamphlet, as, as, as seeing 
that you know the United States has to solve the world's problems. <clears throat> well, the world doesn't see it that way necessarily, but but there are two Americas: what I call noble America and nasty America. And there's not just noble America. All they're seeing is noble America that has to march in and bring democracy to everybody. Well, nasty America supported an awful lot of awful regimes for the sake of American business. You know, so like Pinochet and so many others. So, so yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the subject of the balanced society is, I'm going to use that as a segue. By the way, Phil, you, you start off saying something about wh why I'm so influential or something, or I, I forget you said, you, you were going to ask something right at the beginning to go back to the previous. You started to ask something. Oh, I just mentioned at the beginning that, that I, at the last time we talked, that I had brought up the subject of leadership and I asked you if you thought of yourself as a leader yeah. and, and we talked about that okay. and if you thought of yourself as a mentor and we talked about that okay, so, that's, so that's all I okay. did so um, I, balanced society I, I'm, I'm going to mention the manuscript that you're working on now rebalancing society radical renewal beyond left right and center the last version that I read was uh, published March 14 2014 on your website www.mintzberg.org actually February 28th February 28th, okay. But, um, by the way, I'm not working on it now. I sent it to the publisher this morning. Oh. <laughs> the, the, the book version. <laughs> so it's I'm not literally it, hot off the I, press. I'm not working on it this <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> okay. But you were this morning. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. So among the topics you address in there is leadership. Well, I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes. Um, the version that I read had an executive summary which is just a few lines long. It says, we have to leave behind the linear politics of left, right, and center to understand that a balanced society like a stable tool, stool has to rest on three solid legs. A public sector of political forces rooted in respected governments, a private sector of economic forces based on responsible business, and a plural sector of social forces manifested in robust communities. So we have the three uh, legs of a balanced society, public sector, private sector, and plural sector. Um, why is a balanced society important? Why does it matter? Well, if you go through history and look at societies where one of those sectors dominated, including the plural sector, mm -hmm. um, they're not hard to find and they're not very pretty. Mm -hmm. So communism was an example of, uh, of, the, of the public sector dominating, but a lot of, you know, a lot of kingdoms and, uh, you know, a lot of distortion, a lot of state despotism was based on public sector being all-powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no shortage of that. We're seeing now the effects of the private sector dominating and it's turning out to be not very pretty at all and that's what a lot of uh, what I'm doing in the pamphlet is about and, and not very pretty in, in two respects. One is, one is the domination both domestically in the US and other countries and globally of corporate forces uh, you know, we live in corporate societies, not market economies, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned. Um, and also, if you look at uh, an enormous number of shocking statistics about life in the U.S. today, I'm talking about incarceration rates, I'm talking about obesity, I'm talking about uh, voter turnout, I'm talking about social mobility, which is way down, uh, I'm talking about, uh, which is shocking yeah. of all, I'm talking, I mean, I can go on and on. Poverty. <laughs> Poverty, uh, income disparities. Gun violence. <laughs> yeah, so you just go on and on. So so that's not very pretty. And and uh, to me, domination of the plural sector is what Nazism is basically about. Nazism is, is uh, where it began, uh, you know, starts largely as, ca or fascism starts largely as community movements. Yeah. The Taliban is a community organization. That's not pretty either. So any society in which one of them dominates is not very good. China today, two of them kind of dominate, the public and the private mm -hmm. sector, and the plural sector is totally marginalized. And that's not good either. So it looks like healthy societies find balance. And as I say, the U.S. between 45 and 89 was rather balanced. So what happened after 1989 to put the U.S. in a position? The end of thinking. <laughs> the end of thinking, the end of history, um, and and this belief, this I, I think there are two sets of factors. One is the marginalization of government. You know, I was at a party in Virginia a few years ago, in rural Virginia, 
And these guys were going on and on and on about taxes and government and how awful. And at one point I said, you're all retired military people. You never earned a nickel that didn't come out of those taxes. Never dawned on them. Never dawned on them. It's such a knee-jerk, talk about the end of thinking, it's such a knee-jerk belief. If you, if you say, good, we'll get rid of government, let's start with the police forces. <laughs> you know, I mean, let's start with the military. Isn't that government? I thought the military was government. Am I mistaken? Yeah. You know, Americans have the right to bear arms. Do Americans have the right to bear nuclear arms? You know, has anybody ever addressed that question with the gun, with the gun lobby? No. So, you know, I have this imaginary conversation with the with the gun lobby, saying, "All right, Americans have right to bear nuclear arms. Do they have the right to bear nuclear arms?" And they'll say, "Well, yeah, what kind of nut are you?" And I say, "Well, we've established. It's just a question of where we draw the line." Now, I draw the line between knives and pistols. Where do you draw the line? Cluster bombs? Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like where do you draw the line? It's just a question of drawing the line. So, so your first chapter um, of Rebalancing Society is called The Triumph of Imbalance, and it's largely, although not completely, about the United States. So why did you focus that chapter on the U.S.? Well, actually, I have a section now that um, I might have been there too, but, but where I have a conversation with a guy from Sweden who says, you know, why the United States? Sweden's in great shape. And I basically just said, just you wait. The, f the forces of globalization are undermining governments everywhere, and it's led largely by the United States. The United States is not alone on this grand march mm -hmm. to imbalance, uh, but it's leading the march. Um, and that's why uh, mm -hmm. uh, there's a need to focus on the United States. There's also this belief that the world is kind of running out of control and only America can save it, which is sort of the Soros Friedman thing I talked yeah. about a minute ago. And, you know, Napoleon, there was a biographer of Napoleon I once read who said that uh, Napoleon was a real visionary because he saw United Europe long before the EU. And I saying, well, did the Prussians and the Russians see it that way? Like <laughs> <laughs> Napoleon's version of United Europe, you know, it's America's version of the United World, which is a, a world that could be a world of predatory capitalism. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, with income disparities and all the other things that go with it. Um, I I'm going to see if I can get you to respond to a few of the things that you wrote in that chapter. And the first thing that struck me is on page seven of the version that I read, you refer to a ruling by the United States Supreme Court in 1886, which reinforced property rights, you said, with a vengeance. Corporations were recognized as persons with equal protection of the laws recorded in the 14th Amendment, which was enacted to protect the emancipated slaves. And this has made all the difference from the liberties for individuals enshrined in the American Constitution sprang the entitlements for corporations. This proved to be a major step on America's long march toward imbalance. So. I think that case was Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad. I think I looked up the right one. But why do you see the Supreme Court ruling as an important step on the road to imbalance in the United States? Well, first of all, it was never decided by the Supreme Court, or debated by the Supreme Court. It was assumed by the Supreme yeah. Court, and the note was in fact written by a clerk who had been, a, or uh, who was, I think, at the time, the president of a bank, mm -hmm. um, and that was called a header note or something like that and they got uh, something like top yeah. mode and, and they got rid of that um, they got rid of those later but by then the damage was done he wrote it they just assumed it and suddenly corporations became persons and you're seeing it today with this uh, current Supreme Court uh, enabling corporations to donate what they like to political campaigns it's absurd mm -hmm. it's completely absurd you know in the last election the United States uh, not the United States, but different groups uh, and parties spent billions, and yet some states didn't have the money to staff the polling booths. Just think about it. Mm -hmm. There were billions of dollars spent on the election, and some states couldn't even staff polling booths. We're talking thousands of dollars. If that's not imbalance, I don't know what is. So. Is that a failure of a balanced society or a failure of leadership? Well, I would say a failure of a balanced society is a failure of leadership in a way. Um, but it's also a failure of leadership in two respects, I would argue. Uh, one is that clearly whoever's 
leading is not leading in a very constructive or, uh, or uh, enlightened way, but two is that the overemphasis on leadership overemphasizes the individual. Mm -hmm. and, and part of one of my points in the pamphlet is that America didn't invent democracy, it just gave impetus to a particularly individualistic form of democracy. Mm -hmm. But real democracy, it seems to me, across the three sectors is, is you know, is, a demo is both individualistic and collective and communal. And some balance mm -hmm. between those, whereas U.S. democracy is is largely tilted towards individualistic mm -hmm. democracy. So that and, and and leadership is a is is rooted in individualism because as soon as you say leader, you're talking about one person. Mm -hmm. You're never talking about the collectivity. Right. The word leader means one person. It may be a leader who's energizing other people and helping them and even 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 facilitating their their energy and their activity but it's always focused on an individual and that's part of the problem on page nine again in that chapter you said in 1989 200 years after the US Constitution went into effect the stage was set for America's free fall into imbalance the only thing required was a push that push came as the Cold War ended indeed because the Cold War ended so why did the end of the Cold War push the U.S. over the over the edge <laughs> into free fall? Yeah, this wasn't. This is my point. Other people made this point too. But but the point is that uh, uh, that um, um, that communism, uh, not so much com communism, but certainly socialism or left wing parties, act as a constraint on free flowing capitalism. And with that constraint largely removed, certainly the communist constraint was removed, but even the whole left side of the political spectrum was dismissed because if that, those governments were bad, then the assumption was all governments are bad. So the left was extremely weak, and then and the right um, uh, became much more powerful. Not only the right, but the center. And, and the center became very paralyzed, as it is right now in the United States, which is fine for the private sector. There's nothing more encouraging of people who believe in that kind of philosophy than to have governments that are that are in in, in straitjackets because mm -hmm. then they do what they like and and, and we're, you know what we're seeing it now you can see it everywhere but what we're seeing it now is in things like just in the last few weeks and things like Facebook and Amazon where they're kind of doing what they like uh, the regulations are very weak governments very weak uh, and you find Facebook is suddenly taking 700,000 people and manipulating their emails for the purpose of some research, which, by the way, seems like absolutely silly, completely silly research. But, but you know, the, the attitude is, as long as we can get away with it, we'll do what we like. Um, and, by the way, if you get caught, um, you don't have to worry because if you're wearing a white collar, you don't. You never go to jail if you're wearing a white collar. Very rarely, you go to jail if you're wearing a blue collar. If little, you, little accountability for white collar crime. Well, if you steal a banana, they put you in jail. But if you steal from all kinds of people by manipulative financial deals, uh, like supposedly Goldman Sachs did with aluminum, recycled aluminum, then that's okay. You know, um, if General Motors, if there were managers and engineers in General Motors who knew about the dangers of these lock switches and did nothing about them, they should be tried for manslaughter. It's cut and dry. Mm -hmm. It's manslaughter. People died because of their, um, their uh, um, uh, irresponsibility. That's manslaughter. Is anybody ever going to be tried on manslaughter? People knew. They knew that people were dying, and they didn't mm -hmm. do a damn thing about it. That's manslaughter. Mm -hmm. Probably they're not going to go to trial for that. No. Yeah. Uh, but as soon as they did, as soon as they did, it would stop. Because engineers and managers would say, I'm sorry, but I have to go public with this because I could end up in jail. It would stop. So what do you It wouldn't stop completely, but a lot of it would be would stop. As long as it's going on this way, it keeps going. So what do you think is going on in the United States that causes Americans to go after blue-collar criminals and not white-collar criminals? Well, like every other country on earth, there's a, there's a very strong status difference. I was just talking yesterday about 
about this guy in the country who looks after our house, and <laughs> and he was and he um, he uh, he refused to tutua me even though the Quebecers tutua everybody normally, and so in turn I refused to tutua him. Uh, and the question is, why doesn't he want to tutua me? And I think it's just. Because somehow, because I own a nicer house or I'm a professor or something, um, you know, there's a sort of a status difference. And, and I, every country has it. Um, and the U.S. has it too. And if you're sort of, you know, not quite as high status because you're a blue clear truck driver who killed someone on the highway, then, you know, they'll try you for manslaughter. But if you're, uh, of course, if you're white collar too for that matter on that thing but but if you're if you're causing the deaths of dozens of people by your irresponsibility in an automobile company that's okay yeah I'm gonna do a sort of a, a technical follow-up here because I'm guessing that the person who's going to transcribe this doesn't either read or speak French so what you're saying oh, yeah. is that the guy who takes care of your house would not address you in the familiar form yeah the yeah. the t is thou and which is long drawn in English and who is you yeah. and it's as if when you and I are friendly I would say well Phil thou art a nice guy and <laughs> and, and if we were formal with each other I would have to say you are a nice guy yeah. <laughs> it doesn't exist anymore in English but it's very yeah. completely current in French yeah all right, so on pages 9 and 10, you said supporting this march toward imbalance, especially in the last half century, has been an economic perspective that has grown into a prevailing dogma. In its boldest form, this centers on an economic man for whom greed is good, property is sacred, markets are sufficient, and governments are suspect. As one view of human society, this makes sense. As the view of human society, it's nonsense. So why is this view that greed is good, property is sacred, markets are sufficient, and governments are suspect? nonsense when it's the primary view of human society. What's wrong with that? Well, if we lived in a society with nothing but greed, nobody, it would just be horrible. Uh, if we lived in a society in which markets are everything, uh, we would end up in absurd situations where, you know, we're going to, you know, we can't, uh, and there are economists who believe this. Uh, there's something called common property, uh, which we would all fight to retain. For example, if, if everybody, somebody could buy and own the ocean so that nobody could sail on it, there'd be a hell of, a, a hell of, a, a hell of an outcry. The, the ocean is common property. Right. Uh, what's under the ocean, the fish under the ocean, are supposedly national property up to 200 miles or whatever it is. Um, and uh, what's the fourth one? Um, uh, greed, Marcus. Um, Oh, and governments are suspect. Well, if governments are suspect, uh, then we better, better close down the military. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just silly. It's just silly. Um, but it's, as I say, as one view, it's fine. It's one view of human nature. But it's become, for some idiot savant, a lot of economists are idiot savant in the sense that they, you know, in the sense that they understand their theory, but they can't tie their shoelaces. Uh, in other words, they can't see past their theories. Um, and it's a very dangerous point of view. And an example of, of the way we talk, the way we sort of, how we deal with economics is some economists in the Bank of Sweden created a prize in honor of Alfred Nobel. And now everybody calls it a Nobel Prize. It is not a Nobel Prize. Alfred Nobel was long dead when they created this prize, and yet they get away with it. If the psychologists created a prize for themselves, nobody would call it Nobel. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we might as well have a Nobel Prize in, in astrology. Mm -hmm. uh, it wouldn't be that far from what some economists are doing these days. Our former colleague at Indiana University, Eleanor Ostrom, made a good career for herself looking at common property issues. Yeah, yeah, no, I cite her in the, yeah. uh, I say I won this prize. So what do you think needs to happen to rebalance society? Uh, let, me, let me back up and ask a, uh, another question. Is it even possible? And then what needs to happen if it is possible? Well, I prefer to not to say... It's definitely possible uh, under... Uh, it's definitely not possible if it is the end of history. In other words, if we destroy ourselves, which we're doing a good job of moving toward between environmental warming and potential for nuclear war and so on, uh, then it's not possible. 
Um, otherwise, it will be possible, it will certainly be possible under the worst possible scenarios other than those, which is that we end up in a fascist world and wake up at some point and reverse that. Um, uh, um, but short of all that, um, we better make it possible when we wake up. Um, uh, I've got a new section in the book now called the Irene Qu uh, All the stuff you quoted before is all still in. Uh, al almost all the points are still in. There's just a few new things. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I call the Irene question. Irene is the wife of a, one of my doctoral students who's quite a mature, sophisticated guy. And she's a, a, ma a finance manager who's worked in the private sector and the plural sector. Uh, and so Joe gave it, her husband gave it to her. And she read it and said, you know, I knew this was going on, but I never realized it to this extent. And they said, what can I do? And I call that the Irene question. And, and the Irene question is, what, what can, can I do? I do? Uh, and, and, and I maintain that there are kind of three sort of thrusts that are necessary. W one is that the worst behaviors have to be reversed, like not putting people into jail for committing crimes. And dispensing with illegal corruption, like bribery in elections, where it's bribery. Mm -hmm. It's nothing but bribery. We, we point to the African, some of the African countries, and say, you know, they're terrible corruption. The difference in the U.S. and other countries, to some extent, is that the bribery is legal. Bribery is perfectly legal in the United You're States. You're talking about political advertising. Uh, well, I'm talking about political advertising. I'm also talking about political donations, uh, yeah, uh, like the gun lobby. Yes, yes. Okay. And both of those things are, it's not, uh, advertising isn't bribery, but it's, but it's distortion. It's using money to distort. Uh, but political donations are bribery. Um, and that's got to stop. It's completely crazy. Uh, the British don't allow paid advertising for their elections, so people do it. Um, in the Canadian election, the last federal election, the, the, uh, the uh, a government was elected with 39% of the popular vote. Every single English language newspaper except one supported the Conservative Party. Hmm. We don't have a free press. We have a corporate press. And, and, and that doesn't help either. We also have stock analysts who are going after Brazil because it had the nerve to elect socialist governments. Mm -hmm. Uh, or populist governments, uh, so so all of that has got to somehow be be corrected somehow, uh, and and we need to reverse immediately the worst of it. And frankly, it's going to take the kinds of things that Solinsky used to do. You remember Solinsky? He was the brilliant, creative guy who led a lot of the um, the uh, sort of the uh, uh, programs or the initiatives to stop, for example, the Kodak, where the blacks were, were uh, felt they weren't being well treated by Kodak, yeah. and he sort of led that movement. He was just a clever guy to get around mm -hmm. them and under them. He was the go he was the David with the slingshot, um, and we've got to do more of those kind of clever things. There were people in in San Antonio, Texas, who were mad at their phone company, so they all overpaid their bills by one cent. And it just <laughs> tied the bureaucracy in knots. I mean, there are clever ways mm -hmm. of stopping the worst of it and bringing attention to the worst of it. And then we need to develop all kinds of new ways of doing things, not only in the public private sector, but also in the, especially in the plural sector. And there are things like the Grameen Bank, which is an economic initiative mm -hmm. in the plural sector for microfinancing. Mm -hmm. So I mean, there's all kinds of economic as well as social and political initiatives in the plural sector. We need much more of that. A and then we'll, we'll get reform from government and socially responsible business when they get the message from other people. Um, anybody who thinks that corporate social responsibility is going to compensate for the corporate social irresponsibility we have now is living in a win-win mm -hmm. wonderland. You know. So government follows, public opinion doesn't create it. This government follows public opinion, it doesn't create it. To a large extent, yeah. yeah, sure, to a significant extent. So you spent most of your professional career studying one leg of the stool, the, the business 
but well, actually, I didn't. Actually, I didn't. Okay. I'm in a business school. My first research was my doctoral thesis where I observed five chief executives. Right. Three came from business, one came from healthcare, and one came from education or government. Okay. Um, almost all my research has always been, uh, what's the word in religion when you're agnostic? Uh. <laughs> has almost all been agnostic mm -hmm. about sectors. Mm -hmm. So I've studied a lot. I studied, we did a major study of Volkswagen and a big supermarket chain, but we also did study of U.S. strategy in Vietnam. We did a study of the National Film Board of Canada, which is a government-owned agency. So I've always been agnostic about it. I've done plenty of things for business, but lots in healthcare and other things. So I mean, the, the question I wanted to ask you is, how did you get from your study of, maybe I should have said organizations, to a balanced society? You know, I'm just writing about that now because I put a new piece mm -hmm. in the sort of, I, I, it's not so much new, but I, I put a piece in the book. It's called, uh, they usually do it in, in Barrett Kohler. It's about the author, but I put it about the author and this effort. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I sort of have a paragraph about who I am, where I came from, that I, an engineer who worked for the railroad and all that. And then I say, why am I doing this? Um, and, and I visited Prague in 1991, mm -hmm. which was two years after the Velvet Revolution, after the fall of communism. Mm -hmm. And right then, and I, that's I, actually recorded, uh, I, 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 never, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't figure out how to publish that article. And it turns out the Scandinavian Journal of Management published, and I'm glad mm -hmm. they did because mm -hmm. it's kind of on record, that right then and there I was talking about three sectors. I was talking about imbalance. Mm -hmm. I was talking about the need for balance. I was talking about how capitalism triumph is not the answer. So I had all that back in 1992, and, or 1991 actually when I was there, and I published in 1992. And since then, it's hardly gotten better. Um, so it was what you experienced when you were in Prague in 91 that sort of brought that into focus for you the first time? As I have no recollection of anything before that, mm -hmm. although I was always suspicious of, you know, global forces and corporate forces that were not responsible. Um, but I think it brought it into juxtaposition with East versus West. So you are a winner of the Lifetime Achievement Award by the International Leadership Association, and so I do want to spend some time talking to you about leadership, but I'll note that having, I haven't read everything you wrote because I would be alive if I said I did, but <laughs> but I, I read quite a bit, and in various places I would say you've expressed intense skepticism about leadership and how it's addressed in the literature. And the piece that I liked, so it's just my opinion here, is one of your publications entitled Enough Leadership, which appeared in the Harvard Business Review in November 2004, and I, I'm going to read a couple of lines to get you to respond to those, but I will say that I, I really found your opening lines in this article to be bold and challenging and provocative, and I assume that's what you were after, because you certainly got that reaction out of me. It so <laughs> It worked. So here's what you said in the opening line. You said, leadership, we all know what it is. It stimulates teamwork, takes the long view, builds trust, and more. Right. So let me ask a few questions. And then you posed a few questions. If leadership is about stimulating teamwork, how are the stock options distributed in your company? If leadership is about taking a long view, how many of those stock options can be cashed in in the short run? If leadership is about building trust, if people are really your greatest assets, how many of these assets have been shown the door in recent years? And how much trust is that engendered among those who remain? So, and then you, you wrapped up by saying, in many companies, the answer to these questions expose a cult of leadership that is dragging business down. So I read the article, but I'm going to use your quote to try to get you to talk about some of these things. And what do you mean by a cult of leadership that is dragging business down? I mean that there's such an overemphasis on the chief executive of big businesses or businesses in general, although in entrepreneurial companies, I'm more sympathetic to it. But there's such a such a um, an emphasis on it uh, that teamwork becomes much more difficult. Look, it's almost it's what I call bloodletting, contemporary bloodletting. You don't make your numbers on Wall Street, so you fire five thousand people. It's almost knee jerk. It's almost automatic. You don't make your numbers, so you fire five thousand people. 
Well, if those 5,000 people were redundant today, how come they were redundant last week before you issued these numbers? And you were running the company last week. How come you didn't notice? Like, did they become redundant just coincidentally the day after you... Uh, you issued your stock. Uh, they asked you. They after you issued your numbers, like, like what kind of game is this? And what effect does this have on the people left behind when these firings are so arbitrary? So, was, are these firings a necessary step on the road to efficiency, or a symbolic act that has no meaning other than the symbol? Look, if a company's got its back to the wall and is going bankrupt, obviously it's going to be going to have to do things like that. We're not talking. We're talking about Pfizer that didn't quite make its obscene numbers that it did previously, so it's firing left and right. You know, uh, uh, it, it's a message to stock analysts that we're listening to you. We're listening to what? Listening to your short-term pressures. That's what we're listening to. And and uh, and it's 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 no way to build a sustainable enterprise. It's no you know we have this in politics. The game is, we have it in sort of parliamentary politics, but you get it anyway. The game is that if you have a new prime minister, and something goes wrong a week later, it's his or her fault. It's like it's it's like idiotic. I mean, it's not something. I, I don't mean a decision they made. I mean the civil service screwed up. So it's their fault. After all, you've been in power for a week. I, it's just a symbolic game, um, but it's sort of blaming the leaders. Either we praise the leaders to the sky for everything that gets done, or we blame them for everything that happens. Now, they're certainly responsible for some good things and some bad things, but this, this attribution is, is childish. It's just plain childish. So is that, that kind of attribution in addition to being childish? A tactic for avoiding action. I mean, it's easier to fire somebody than it is to yeah. change. And to find out what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, you mentioned stock options in one of your questions. And because I'm a humanist, I know that when people who are not in business schools hear the word stock options, their eyes glaze over. So, could you, what do stock options have to do with effective leadership? Nothing. <laughs> but that's not what you're asking. No, it's not, actually. Uh, well, what I'm looking at is this question you posed here about I know. I know, the, I know. taking the long view. and. Uh, well, because it rewards chief executives for short-term mm -hmm. performance. Yeah. Because nobody knows how to reward them for long-term performance. Because if, if you're the chief executive of XYZ Corporation, or Z, and uh, you're the chief executive, and you say... Uh, uh, and, and I say, yeah, I'm the board chairman and the part-time chairman, and I say, well, we're going to reward you for options, uh, but 10 years after you're gone, and 10 years come along, and you say, well, I left this company in such great shape, and that idiot who followed me destroyed it, and now I'm not getting my options. And I'll say, well, wait a minute, uh, was it that idiot who followed you, or was it the 10-year consequences of those decisions you made back then? And you get into interminable fights about it. So, so the only solution is to get rid of, get rid of stock options altogether. I wrote that in the, um, in, the in an article in the Wall Street Journal, um, and uh, and the private letters that came, like people wrote to an email address rather than posting on the website, were almost all in favor in the Wall Street Journal, including uh, Volcker, who wrote said Bravo. Uh, including people on boards and chief executives who said we're finally we're glad somebody finally said almost all unanimous on the public blog you know it's called a fascist a communist a, you know. <laughs> there's an article in that though isn't there between the what the public response and the private fascinating. response yeah. absolutely fascinating so when we look at top executives taking huge salaries and large shares of stock options when we see companies dismissing employees to reduce expenses, increase profits, or just for symbolic reasons. Are we not seeing capitalism working just the way it's supposed to? Isn't that capitalism in action, doing exactly what it's supposed to do? Mm. You mean being responsive? Making profits, maximizing profit. Well, maximizing what kind of profits, short term or long term? Is that sustainable or not sustainable? I mean, if you, if you like, the, like we saw with the banks, where they were taking massive bonuses and destroying these places so that years later people want to go back and say, give back your bloody bonuses. You've been, 
you. Mm-hmm. You did great harm to this place. Uh, I assume that anybody uh, who's open would say that capitalism is about sustainable profits, not short-term profits. Mm-hmm. And moreover, it's not only about profit, but it's it's a it's a, corporations are members of society. They they shouldn't be they shouldn't be dictating social policy, uh, but they should be responsible uh, in their behaviors. And the first, I, I say to any executive who wants to be socially responsible, I say, don't start with greening, you know, greening your packaging or greening right. your, your offices. Start by getting your, your business out of my government. Your business has no business in my government. You have every right, you as an individual have the same right I as an individual have. Your company has no business meddling in my government. And moreover, you know, claiming that government must not meddle in the affairs of business while business meddles in the affairs of government is hypocrisy. So. <laughs> That's not an issue that comes up very often, is it? <laughs> well, it's just taken for granted. Yeah. But these corporate persons can do what they like. I don't think this is in the first version, I don't know, but somebody in the United States has a suit or some, not a suit, some kind of thing going on where he wants chimpanzees to be recognized as persons in the law. Uh, and the reason he claims is so they'll be well treated. Mm-hmm. And I maintain, <laughs> well, without commenting on that particular thing, I maintain that chimpanzees have a lot stronger claim on personhood than do corporations. They're a lot closer to persons than corporations are. Corporations are not persons. They're collections. They're, you know. I, I mean, would it be possible to, 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 to conclude that this idea that corporations have personhood, which has certainly gotten stronger and stronger over the course of the 20th century, is sort of a logical outgrowth of the existence of the corporate structure to begin with. I mean, one of the one of the things about the corporate structure that made it work was that they had some of the rights that people had. They could buy and sell and own property. They could silver be sued or whatever. Um, isn't what happened just sort of almost a logical outcome of where we started? Well, first of all, technically not, because as I said, the Supreme Court never even discussed it. It's never been debated. <laughs> never been debated or discussed in the Supreme Court, mm-hmm. right to this day. Mm-hmm. It's always been assumed, and in recent rulings it's still assumed. But the original was an assumption. It was never discussed, never debated, mm-hmm. never considered, just assumed. And, and so, um, logical? No, not at all. I mean, there are certain dimensions of it that are logical. Mm-hmm. Um, so, for example, you can't throw me out the window. Uh, that would be considered nasty. But you can't throw this table out the window either um, because you could hurt somebody down below, you're going to damage property and so on. So you can throw neither me nor the table out the window. Does that make me the equivalent of this table? I mean, (laughs) corporations have certain needs that need to be recognized. Um, But by the way, you know, we have a situation here now, very interesting situation where and you've probably heard about it, in a place called Lac Megantic, exactly a year ago, uh, this train started rolling by itself and destroyed the center of the village and killed about 45 people, okay? Um, And uh, and the company conveniently went bankrupt after that. Well, it was the subsidiary of a parent company in Chicago. Now, if that parent company took five cents out of that company, then how can it just wash its hands of that and say our subsidiary just went bankrupt? Then maybe the money it took out caused, I can't accuse them of that, but I don't know, but caused cost-cutting, which led to this problem. Who knows? But, but, but this idea that somehow you can use the corporate umbrella to wipe your hands of something, you, you can bleed a company dry, suck out its profits, declare bankruptcy, and have no responsibility whatsoever for what it does subsequently. Well, that doesn't make any sense at all. Mm-hmm. So, so this idea of the independence of the corporation is an absurdity in some respects. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, the idea is that if we're going to get people to invest in companies, they have to limit their liabilities mm-hmm. somehow, but not their social liabilities, maybe their economic mm-hmm. liabilities. 
but not surpassing social irresponsibility. So what has to happen to get corporations balanced? Being called on activities that are corrupt. Like the accusation in the New York Times that Goldman Sachs was manipulating this this uh, this price, uh, or at least the movement of aluminum, and sucking five billion dollars out of that market, so that everybody who buys a can of anything is now paying Goldman Sachs mm -hmm. for absolutely no contribution whatsoever uh, to society. Mm -hmm. The 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 purpose of Adam Smith's invisible hand is that you do well by doing good um, in the sense that you know if you're if you're making profit for yourself you're contributing to society well these things are making profit for Goldman Sachs you know ostensibly uh, and contributing absolutely nothing to society but actually bring taking things out of society that's got to stop mm -hmm. it's got to stop totally it's got to be challenged totally um, so, so companies like that can no longer get away with that. So, if somebody like uh, like the Ponzi scheme guy, what's his name? Bernie um, Madoff. Mm -hmm. Bernie Madoff. Yeah, if Madoff just steals directly from people, he ends up in jail. But if Goldman Sachs does something which looks an awful lot like stealing from people, uh, but not so directly, uh, they don't go to jail. If they started to be challenged on those things aggressively, uh, if we had laws that called corporations on those kinds of things, uh, there'd be there, those things would stop very quickly. If employees started to challenge their own management, uh, for example, if employees started to say, "By paying yourself 500 times as much as us, as our great leader." you're not a leader at all. So if you think you're 500 times more important than I am, then you're not a leader, and you have no business being in that position. Now, how many chief executives would be left of the Fortune 500? So is that a failure of leadership, or is there something else at work? It's, 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 a, it's worse than a failure of leadership. It's, it's utter narcissism. I once wrote a piece that appeared in the Financial Times. It was a letter from a chief executive saying to the board, please, enable me to lead this company. Don't pay me this way. You know, don't <laughs> offer me these short-term bonuses. Yeah. You know, it's a bit like what, uh, what Buffett wrote about, please tax me more. Mm -hmm. How many of Buffett's friends sort of agreed with him? I mean, publicly. Not too many. So how, how do you define Bill Gates' father yeah. agreed, but I don't think Bill Gates ever did. I don't, I'm not sure. But how do you define leadership? Being smart enough to know your own limitations. How's that? That would be a new one. That would be a new one. Yes. <laughs> well, then I'll try it from a different direction. Then. What do you see as the, the qualities of effective leadership? How do you know it when you see it? I think really good leaders don't take themselves too seriously. I think they, I think they recognize community ship and recognize the importance of community, I'm using the word community ship like leadership, right. or citizenship, community ship, leadership, but I think they recognize that effective organizations are communities of human beings, not collections of human resources, and leadership can be very important, uh, but particularly in established organizations, it's important to the extent that it recognizes the importance of other people, which means we have to get rid of narcissism in the executive suite. Sometimes I think we have nothing but narcissism in the executive suites. We certainly have one hell of a lot of it. And uh, Now, entrepreneurship's a bit different because when you're creating an enterprise, a lot depends. I'm not going to look at Steve Jobs and say, you know, gee, he, maybe he was narcissistic or maybe he took himself too seriously. I don't know if he did or didn't. I never knew the guy, but but that kind of brilliant insight, foresight, 
is another story. But we're talking about people who take over Fortune 500 companies. I mean, not take take you know get appointed chief executive and act as if somehow they're they've created the success. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of them are just destroying those companies. I'm going to go back to this article enough leadership and where you said uh, you went on to argue that some companies have too much leadership. Instead, they need less leadership, just enough leadership. How, you know, how do we encourage just enough leadership, you asked? And you answered that, uh, that we could start removing the dysfunctional separation of leadership and management. Mm -hmm. So what is the dysfunctional separation of leadership and management? Well, Ben has started this. He's a friend. Um, but I utterly disagree with him. Zelesnik <laughs> wrote about this, and Cotter, as usual, is sort of you know playing the, the Zelesnik, same tune. The Harvard Zelesnik, yeah, yes. yeah, and then Cotter piped in. Mm -hmm. Cotter usually pipes in after somebody else, um, and uh, arguing that you know doing the right things versus doing things right, and you know all these nice glib phrases, uh, and I think that's been utterly dysfunctional because the assumption that somehow leadership is separate from management. Management's about getting dirt under your fingernails. It's about knowing what's going on. It's about being on site. It's about managing details. And, and this idea, or at least understanding details, and, and, and somehow this idea that leaders sit above all that uh, means they don't know what's going on. That's what caused the subprime mortgage thing. Either the, the chief executives were utterly cynical and figured we'll make a quick buck and dump it on somebody else, or they didn't know what was going on. How many, how many of those mortgages did, how many of those mortgages did these chief executives have to see by getting out of their office and saying, I'd like to meet one or two of these mortgages at random mm -hmm. and say, well, what's your job? How are you doing? How are you going to be able to pay when the rates go up? And, and it would have been obvious to absolutely anybody. Now, either as they said, either they were utterly cynical saying, we know what's going on, but we're going to dump it on somebody else before we get stuck. Or the ones that got stuck were kind of just out of touch with what they were buying. So do you think they were cynical or out of touch? Oh, I think it was both going on. I, I think some of, some of them were cynical and others, many of the others were out of touch. But, but, but this idea that somehow managers do what you know, nurses in, in, in operating wards call the scut work. You know, the doctors, that's scut work for doctors. And the managers do the scut work and leaders do the grand glorious things. Of course, it's not coincidental that a lot of this comes out of Harvard because Harvard thinks it's creating the great leaders. And how does it create the great leaders? By, by studying a bunch of cases. So they understand companies because they read 10 pithy pages about the company, which is the worst possible way to find out what's going on in a company. Because so you think you know what's going on, you don't know anything. You would argue then that the case system, uh, I think, was pioneered at Harvard. It was, yeah, it was, it was, it was, in effect it was. It was a guy from Northwestern, a businessman from Northwestern who had the idea, I didn't get anywhere there, so he took it to Harvard. Uh, yeah, so it was really developed at Harvard. Yeah, I think it's all part of the problem that Harvard is creating these great leaders by, by having them do hundreds and hundreds of these utterly superficial cases where they've never met the people, they've never used the products, they don't know the markets, but they read 10 or 20 pithy pages, and, and, and that's the way George Bush was created as a leader, and, and you know, who thought he was a great manager, but he right. learned nothing about management at Harvard, because nobody can learn management in a school, you learn management on the job. Then you can come back, like we do in our programs, and, and get them to reflect on their management and their leadership, but, but management and leadership have to be combined. Nobody wants to be led by s nobody wants to be managed by somebody who doesn't lead. Nobody w wants to be should want to be led by somebody who doesn't manage because they don't know what's going on. And that's not micromanaging. It's simply knowing what's going on. There's a big difference. Um, this will give me a chance, a good segue here. Criticism of MBA programs is one of the themes in your writing. Yeah. And when we talked last time, you said MBA programs don't really train managers. So. Is that part of the reason for the dysfunctional separation between leadership and management? Is what goes on in those traditional MBA programs? Well, you can anoint people with the with the holy water of leadership and say, you know, without any justification, and basically say, you know, you've gone to Harvard or McGill or wherever it is, and therefore you're a leader, which is nonsense. It doesn't make anybody into a leader at all, um, and they march out thinking they're leaders. Which I always said they should have a skull and crossbones branded on their forehead, you know, warning not prepared to lead or manage. Um, and uh, so they, they walk out thinking they're all set to 
be great leaders, and they're not. They're not because you earn leadership from the lead. You don't, you know. And and a lot of the danger in businesses, especially where you have an old boys network among the prestigious business schools, is you get ahead because after all, you, you know, you're, you're close to previous alumni. This idea that somehow you're anointed by outsiders, by superiors, uh, so-called, or people who are more senior than you. It's nonsense. The people who know about leadership are the ones who have or haven't been led by people. And, uh, and, and you have to... Um, that's the way you earn leadership. I, one of my things that I don't like at all is this idea of young leaders, because they're almost always designated by old leaders who don't have a clue whether they're able to lead or not. So there are literally probably hundreds of books that claim one way or another to teach somebody to be a leader. There are dozens of programs. And you're arguing, I think, that it's really not possible to train a leader. Uh, yes. I'm, you I'm can't learn to be a leader out of create, a book or in school. Yeah, I, I, I'm arguing that you don't create a leader in a classroom. You can take people with leadership and management capabilities and enhance those by giving them some tips and some advice and so on, largely by enabling them to reflect on their own experience. Um, and I think people like Morgan McCall have written very eloquently about how, you know, leadership really comes from the challenge of difficult jobs and being moved around and, and, and you know, having challenges at critical points in your career. That's how you train leadership. But I think a lot of leadership is kind of born or probably established by the age of five anyway. Well, I mean, that was the next question I was going to ask you, and I was going to set it up by saying that, you know, you know as, a, as a young man, I may have had an unreasonable fantasy that I could have been a major league pitcher or something, but I didn't have the physical skills to do that. So would you argue that good leaders are born or made or some combination thereof? I mean, can anybody be a leader? Uh, no, but it's surprising how many people can emerge out of the blue with surprising leadership capabilities, you know, constantly surprising ourselves with people who actually nobody expected it of them. Sometimes in a crisis, you'll find that somebody will emerge who nobody expected to be and will grab leadership uh, uh, needs and do something with them. Um, so you never quite know. Um, so you could be born with all kinds of capabilities that could come out in all kinds of strange ways. Um, but uh, uh, in my experience, a lot of the people who think they were God's gift to leadership and everybody around them thought they were God's gift to leadership um, have not turned out to be very pretty. You know, last night we were watching on CNN I see, uh, the U.S. networks just seem never to get over the uh, history of military endeavors. It's just like every time you turn on a U.S. station at about 11 o'clock at night. No. It's just so like, so but, which military endeavor was well, this CNN? Was, this was Vietnam. Oh. And, and, you know, revisiting the whole thing for the millionth time. And, uh, and of course, Johnson takes all the hits. Kennedy takes a few, but Johnson takes all the hits. Kennedy was much more responsible for that than Johnson was. Kennedy, and no American wants, he's too good looking, and his wife is too pretty for him to have, you know, been anything but grand. It was Kennedy's fault. Kennedy chose to escalate. Ch Kennedy was blind, and, and surely, surely it could have been obvious to anybody who bothered with a little bit of history that the Vietnamese did not have a history of palsiness with the Chinese, and, and to stop communism in Vietnam was completely idiotic for anybody who bothered to check that history, and yet he chose to escalate it. And after the experience of the French that were defeated, humiliated by the Vietnamese, and eventually the Americans are, I think Iraq... Yeah, Bien Phu, yes. Yeah, and I think Iraq is an indication that America learned absolutely nothing from Vietnam. Absolutely nothing. And going into Afghanistan, 
because bin Laden started in Afghanistan when everybody who went into Afghanistan came out with their tails between their legs. Everybody. The Russians had just done that. Just like the French had just done it in Vietnam. And I don't think America will learn anything from Vietnam. Because it never stood back, like people like Soros and Friedman I was talking about earlier, never stood back and said, wait a minute, what exactly happened there? You know? So, so do you think that the mistake that the Bush administration made in going into Afghanistan was ignorance of history or what? Uh, ignorance of lots of things. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but ignorance of history. Arrogance? I'm trying to... I, I think the Bush putting administration... Putting words had, in your mouth here. But no, no, I think the Bush <laughs> administration had a touch of that. Um, of course it was arrogance in history. You know, being a Canadian... We went into Afghanistan. You know why we went af to Afghanistan? And does anybody in this country say this? You know why we've gone, we went into Afghanistan? Because we were in purgatory. We were in purgatory. We didn't go in to Iraq, so how could we say no to Afghanistan? And uh, mm -hmm. look at all the countries that went in, they're all going out with their tails between their legs. Yeah. Whereas Canada has a long history of being involved in peacekeeping yeah. missions. You've got no a more. nice monument in Ottawa to the peacekeepers? And Probably. Yeah. No more. Yeah. We, have a, we have a neocon mm -hmm. government that is far to the right of certainly Obama mm -hmm. and in a league with Bush. Um, I'm going to quote one more time from Rebalancing Society and the version that I read, this is on page 43, you said Leadership is all the rage these days. Have a look at the thousands of books about it on Amazon and then look for a few on followership. Yet the more we obsess about leadership, the less we get out of it. As one hero go down, goes down the black hole of leadership, a desperate search begins for the next one. Can the very concept of leadership be flawed? And then you answer your own question, yes, in at least two ways. First is the overemphasis on the individual. Mention the word leadership and up comes the image of a single person no matter how determined he or she may be to involve others. In this world, we need more attention to shared community ship served by the leadership. Or, if you like, think about community ship as collective leadership. The most effective organizations generally function as communities of human beings, not collections of human resources. So, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but what do you mean by the overemphasis on the individual? Well, your laws, one's laws, any country's laws, can protect, can uh, emphasize individual rights, they can emphasize collective rights, they can emphasize communal rights. Um, if you look at the trade-out between those three in the United States, you find collective rights are relatively weak in the United States compared to individual rights. Communal rights, I'm not sure the correct talk about communal rights, but certainly de Tocqueville devoted a lot of mm. democracy in America to non-business, non-government associations that were always very, very strong in the United States. The, the force that's weakened them is not just capitalism, but really technology because a lot of these technologies have forced us to become more and more isolated from each other. So, you know, we could be doing this on email and it wouldn't be nearly as effective as you sitting here and, 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 and us discussing it face to face. But more and more we're sitting in front of screens and the only thing we touch, we're in touch. The only thing we're in touch with is the keyboard or the screen if you're on an iPhone. And, um, and uh, and and so, and so individual rights have been strengthened, and collective rights have been weakened. Now, disastrous societies are ones that either overemphasize collective rights, as communism did, although they didn't do a very good job of that. But they actually did better in some respects. I mean, literacy in Cuba went up enormously. Yeah. Healthcare in Cuba went up enormously under communism. So they do look after some communal rights some collective rights, um, and then communal rights, um, we, you know, the Taliban, not the Taliban, but the Muslim Brotherhood 
in Egypt was certainly looking after communal rights, but only their own community, the hell with every other community. Um, and in the United States, it's been an emphasis on the right of in the individual. So, you know, I'm wading into ground I don't know much about, but, but uh, we don't have a Fifth Amendment in Canada um, uh, that you can't testify against yourself. That's, right. that's an example of individual mm -hmm. rights, but I'm not sure I, I should wade into that ground, but I kind of wonder. So, can you think of any organizations that function as what you call communities of human beings and not collections of human resources? Yeah, name, find any poll of most admired corporations and they'll be on that list for one of two reasons. Either that or some entrepreneur who's just mm -hmm. been fabulous, like, like uh, Jobs at Apple. I don't know if people would call Apple a community thing, maybe, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I haven't read the books on Apple, mm -hmm. but maybe. But, but um, you know, whenever you get polls of most admired corporations, usually that's, uh, most of them are there because of that. Um, so, because they treat people well. So pick, take your pick. There aren't that many these days, but there are still plenty around. Where they put the emphasis on Functioning together, collaboration, uh, believing in the company yeah. and not just your job, you know, de-emphasis of individual bonuses, de-emphasis of individual performance assessment, and more group assessment. You said, you argued there that there were two things wrong, and the first was overemphasis on the individual. The second, you said, is the fashionable but detrimental distinction between leaders and management managers. One is grand, does things right, the other is ordinary, does things right, and then you cite Bennis and Zelesnik. Try doing the right things without doing them right. Indeed, try leading an organization without managing, and it has become so common we won't know what's going on. Okay, so I noticed that you started by taking on uh, the second flaw, um, by taking on two of the giants in the scholarship of leadership. Um, Warren Bennis, probably best known for becoming a leader, Forbes magazine described him as the dean of leadership gurus, and then Abraham Selesnik's path-breaking article on leadership managers and leaders, uh, Harvard Business Review, 1977. So, I mean, did you pick these two on purpose? Is this an example no, of Henry they, Mintzberg, the contrarian, just no, no, not at all, skewering the giants? No, or? no, because they're the specific one. In fact, I had originally quoted Selesnik, and somebody said, "You better look back at Ben as he yeah. started it." Yeah. Warren's a friend. Um, and I, well, I actually knew you two knew each other, but yeah. 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 No, he's a friend. Mm -hmm. um, and I haven't seen him for some years. I don't know, is he okay? I, I, I probably, I mean, the recorder's going, but it's my understanding that he's, that he's ill. That's yeah. what I've heard, yeah. But I haven't heard from him for a while, but no, he's been a friend. But um, no, 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 I picked them because they were promoting this leadership, this separation between leadership and management. I could mention Cotter, too. Mm -hmm. Cotter's always picking up what other people do. And again, you said uh, in enough leadership, not, let's involve the followers in the selection of leaders. True leaders earn their leadership through the enthusiastic support of their followers. So how do we do that? <laughs> you know, I mean, it sounds good, but how do we, how do, we do that? Well, but you see it all the time. Mm -hmm. You see it when kids are playing, and some kids, they just want to follow some other kid because he or she has certain charisma or feeling or is smarter or 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 is a bully and 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 forces them that's also a dimension <laughs> of it um but you see that all the time you see people who just have natural leadership capabilities and they're not necessarily in positions of leadership um but they're admired um for their generosity uh, for their intelligence, for their cleverness, and so on. And when a society is in trouble, it'll turn to people who can sort of lead them out of trouble. So, when we talked last time, you said leadership is defined by the lead, and we more or less talked about that here, and you certainly hit that point of view in this article that I've been quoting from Enough Leadership. So, what is the difference between that kind of leadership and demagoguery? 
Uh, which kind of leadership? The, the kind where it's defined by the lead, where you know leaders. Oh, I see what you mean. You know. um, no, but it's all two sided. Mm -hmm. It's all two sided. You can't have one without the other. I mean, not not that you can't have one without the other. What I mean is, you you get both as a consequence. Sure. Um, or you get people who are good and who are necessary and, and, and who people choose to lead and then once in positions of power become corrupt uh, and become demagogues. Um, so they end up in positions of power for good reason but should have been pushed out of there long before they became demagogues. So it's sometimes the same people who do it and that happens very often mm -hmm. where people who are really admired and you know are good and are capable and necessary and just hang on too long and then don't want to give up you know mm -hmm. in politics especially but i guess in any position of politics especially people don't want to give up uh power so they'll do anything to hang on and uh and and engage in the worst kind of skullduggery so do you think that part of being an effective leader is knowing when to walk away sure when when to throw in the towel and call sure. it quits and Sure, mm -hmm. sure. How often does it happen? And you can point to cases where it happens, mm -hmm. but not often. So there is an argument in the literature. It happens to be one that I don't agree with, I'll be honest, but it's out there. <laughs> and that is that if, if people are able to persuade other human beings to do bad things, commit genocide, for example, that that's not leadership, it's something else. And so... Oh. Uh, it is leadership, unfortunately. Well, that's that's the question that I was going to ask you. If, if people were able, by force of personality, to persuade other people to do bad things, you know, Hitler, Idi Amin, the Skillman at Enron, the Grand Dare Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan, I don't know. Are those people leaders? Yeah. yeah. We can't take leadership as just being doing good. I mean, we can define leadership any way we like, and we can say leadership is doing good. But if you want to define leadership in some fundamental sense, it's it's people choosing to follow, uh, and but but don't forget, you know you're in a difficult situation as a nation. I mean, look at Germany. The Germans had some reason to be angry in the twenties. Yeah, after the they had reasons to be angry because they were punished for losing the war, but the war was. Imbecilic. Uh, but World War One, yes, was imbecilic. That's yeah. right. And they were punished, and so they had their comeuppance. Now, and so some of them would follow Hitler because he was going to restore their pride. Well, of course, he turned out to be a monster. Um, but uh, so, at what point, you know, how do you distinguish these things? Sometimes you try. I mean, you can distinguish the consequences, but sometimes you try to. Um, to find someone who will lead you to something better um, and then after a while maybe they led you to something better but then they might lead you to something worse after that so it's not like it's not like the record is always positive we, we talked some at the beginning about your use of the United States as, a, as, as an example about the, the, the rise of imbalance so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a question that relates to the United States that you're obviously very familiar with. And that is, there's a large movement in the United States of people who are unhappy with government, suspicious of people who are different than they are, afraid of change, sus suspicious of science, um, and yet they live in what's arguably one of the richest nations in the world in terms of resources and money and yeah. quality of life. How do you think that happened? Why are they so negative when they've yeah. got such privilege? Yeah. I mean, you talked about the military people who, who were complaining when, at this party you are at in Virginia. I mean, you know, a lot of the angst in the United States is coming out of lifestyle and so on. So that, you know, one of my points is that societies that have developed can be de-developed socially. They can develop economically and de-develop socially. And so, no matter how much wealth you have in the United States, if your kids are on drugs, you know, and you're and there's violence all around you, and you got to live in a gated community, and so on and so forth, that wealth may not be serving you all that well. So, it's not surprising, necessarily, that 
this amazingly developed country which has brought so much amazingly progressive stuff to the world is suffering um, and I think it's suffering now because it um, the lifestyle that's created this economic development is one of mobility it's one of depreciation of community or not depreciation but but loss of some aspects of community um, and it's one of tremendous pressure tremendous pressure you know even Canadians who are quite different in some ways though they don't seem different um, and much more social stability in Canada people don't move my my presence when I meet somebody in the States oh you're still at McGill uh, Canadians don't say are you still at McGill <laughs> it's, of course you're still at McGill <laughs> you know unless something went wrong in the States is are you still at McGill because every you know the, the, when the music comes on everybody changes chairs in the United States so 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 there's a lot of, and, and, and that's what makes Americans so friendly uh, because they have to make friendships immediately whereas people in other countries don't make friendships that quickly but doesn't matter because they don't move so they, they, they take time to make their friendships but a lot of that has created a lot of angst a lot of uh, um, and, and the other thing of course through the media sometimes I think America is the land of theater uh, American politics are just theater most of the time it's, it's, just, it's just one show after another it's just amazing kind of what goes on Mm -hmm. um, and um, and uh, you know with this uh, with this for example uh, not passing the budgets and mm -hmm. the government running out of money it's like it's like theater it's almost amusing it's like a show it's like a non the the Brazilians have soap operas and the Americans have reality <laughs> I don't mean reality shows I mean reality oh. um, and so, so 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 there's a lot of instability in life and, and and when you look at figures on use of illicit drugs use of antidepressants uh, and it's just a whole string of, you know of, of awful statistics 70% um, of working men um, are unhappy in their jobs uh, I mean think of that um, that was one sort of thing I read so. so, if leadership is largely defined by the led, could one then conclude that leadership is situational? That is, a person who might be effective in one situation yeah, and not be in another. And absolutely, absolutely, leadership is about the condition, the nature of the people, the kind of people. Yeah. So, one more question that draws on enough leadership, where you you discussed the importance of leaders being engaged. You said leaders engage others by above all engaging themselves. These leaders are not perched on top, they work throughout. So how does, how does a leader work throughout? What, is, what does that mean? It means that they're out of their offices, they're around, they know what's going on, they're not micromanaging, they're not mm -hmm. trying to meddle in everybody's affairs, they're simply present. I mean, there was a head of a supermarket chain here. He used to go shopping in his own stores every Saturday. Okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> just not to check people out. He just wanted to see what the service was like, how things were going on. He wanted to meet the staff. Mm -hmm. He just he would amble around the stores. You know, that's engagement, um, and they're engaged. and And it means you're everywhere. It means mm -hmm. there's a company. I don't know if they still do it, but a company called Kikao in Japan, where all their meetings are held in the open. No meetings are held behind closed doors, used to be anyway. No meetings behind closed doors. They're all held in the open, and anybody can join any meeting. So if a worker is walking by the executive committee, they can just pull up a chair and sit down and join the meeting. If the president is, is in the factory and the foreman is having a meeting, the president can pull up a chair. Probably you see more of the latter than <laughs> the former, but, you know, and that's what being everywhere means. They, it's just open cultures. Um, this idea that somehow, you know, 
corporate activity happens in executive suites and it's about the big things. You know, one of the things I, in my book, Simply Managing, I sort of get into is that leaders, senior managers take the long view and junior managers take the short view. So I observed the head of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police uh, with his executive committee in a morning meeting. And what were they doing? They were looking at clips from the last night TV show, TV news, to find out where the RCMP was mentioned so that they could preempt or at least advise the minister. We have question period in Canada, right? In Parliament right. where they ask questions. And, and to protect the minister from any questions that might be asked because of that. Taking the long view? Is anybody going to say you shouldn't be doing that because that's the short view? Then I observed the front country manager in the Banff National Park. Front country means the civilized part right. of the park. And, um, As opposed <laughs> to the back country. <laughs> which is supposedly <laughs> uncivilized. <laughs> and, um, and he was in very involved in a big fight over a parking lot expansion of a parking lot that the environmentalists were dead set against and the impact of that would have been over 10, 20, 30 years. That's the short view. Mm -hmm. So here's a first line manager worried about something that's going to have a decades long impact. Here's a chief executive of a 22,000 member police force concerned with, with, uh, with what's going to happen that afternoon in Parliament. So all these simple things about short run, long run, it's all nonsense. Um, so teamwork, distribution of stock options, people's greatest assets, trust, artificial separation between leadership and management, involving followers in the selection of leaders, the importance of leaders working throughout. Um, I was going to ask you if, if there are any companies doing that, but we kind of talked about that. So I'm going to I'm going to come at this a different way. Are you familiar with something called the Scanlon Plan? Yeah, I remember that from years ago, where where people were paid collectively. Yeah, were were rewarded collectively. I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, so it was it was it was implemented by Herman Miller Furniture Company in about yeah, 1950. Yeah. Is that? Are you are you familiar enough with with that to, to say that that would be an example of what you're talking about or not? It was it was certainly an effort to do things like that, yeah, and and, and emphasize community. And you you see examples of that in different ways all the time, um, as opposed to rewards to individuals and so on. Um, there's a scandal in Montreal now because one of the municipalities or one part of the city, one of the municipalities was cutting budgets left and right. Um, and increase the salaries of their senior uh, employees, senior sort of department heads. And, and the mayor or, who are, or whoever it was said, well, you know, uh, we're simply rewarding them for performance. Well, you tell me how you measured that performance. You know what they did. They brought in consultants who said, who they paid to say, oh, well, well yeah, he's really doing well. And, you can't measure, but it's very hard to measure the performance of a manager and know that what looks great today is not going to be wonderful five years from now. So I'm going to ask you one more question that relates to leadership, and then we'll move on. But And I'm going to kind of follow up on something we talked about last time. I asked you when we visited last time if you thought of yourself as a leader, and you said no. Um, and I will, as we've noted, you have more than once been described as a guru. And, I mean, it's all over the place. So... Do you ever feel pressure to live up to the public persona of Guru Henry Mintzberg? Do you ever feel like you need to be that person? No. I'm a Swami anyway. <laughs> you told me that, but that's... <laughs> um, no, I just think, I think that vocabulary is, uh, you know, it's, it's meant to be complimentary, but it's a bit silly. Look, I would say I'm not a leader. If people follow my ideas and like my ideas, and obviously I'm exhibiting yeah. some kind of leadership quality so and and I think I, I am sort of playing the role we're developing a MOOC now you know one of these massive open online courses called yep. a GROOC uh, it's for groups a MOOC group for groups <laughs> uh, and yeah I'm probably playing a leadership role in in kind of but we're working very collaboratively together mm -hmm. this is not my baby there's four of us working very collaboratively together one's a doctoral student one's a colleague one's a, a person who's administering the whole thing and we're a team, totally. But one can be a leader in a team situation. Right? Yeah, I mean, I I think people look to me for certain things in that group. But um, but uh, yeah, so so I can't deny sort of you know I'm, I've tried to take a leadership position in 
in new forms of management development, you know, new forms of training managers, uh, try to take a leadership position there, not that anybody's following, but uh, not very many, but, but maybe someday. So we're going to actually, we're going to talk about that. I, um, I, for the benefit, I want to talk to you a little bit about MBA programs, of which you've been both highly critical and then develop, you know, develop programs as well. Um, and it's an important, it's, it's an element in your body of published work. But for the benefit of somebody who's going to listen to this, I'm just going to mention three, which I, I hope are highlights, and then ask you some questions. So in the mid-1980s, as I understand it, you asked your dean here at McGill to reduce your teaching load by taking you out of the rotation of teaching MBA students, something that you'd actually been doing for about 15 years before that. And as I understand it, you also offered to have him reduce your pay along with the reduced teaching yeah, load. Yeah, I'm half-time. I've been half-time. So. He proposed 75%, and a couple of years later I said, make it 50 <laughs> And then in 1989, you published, if I counted right, your fifth book, Mintzberg on Management, Inside Our Strange World of Organizations, and one of the chapters is titled Training Managers, Not MBAs. 2004, book number 11, Managers, Not MBAs, A Hard Look at the Soft Practice of Managing and Management Development. So if you look at the, t the title of that 11th book, um, that sort of continues the theme of the contrarian when you announce you're taking a hard look. But um, w what do you mean by the soft practice of managing and management development? What is the soft well, practice? Well, I mean, there's nothing very firm about what makes an effective manager. There's nothing very firm about the conventional ways of, of running MBA programs to train managers. In fact, I think it's absolutely dysfunctional when it comes to training managers. I don't think it's dysfunctional when it comes to uh, imbibing uh, functional skills mm -hmm. like marketing and finance. I think it's very good at that. Uh, but I think it's dysfunctional when it comes to the training of management. So that's what I mean by the soft uh, practice. Uh, the, the, there's no, you know, if you're, if you're a physician, you've got to learn a lot of things to do it right. Uh, if you're a manager, there's no place to go, including the business schools, where you can learn how to be a manager except on the firing line. That's what I mean. Um, and I don't consider myself a contrarian. Uh, a contrarian is someone who opposes for the sake of opposing, um, uh, wants to be contrary, uh, just for its own sake. Uh, I don't think I ever want to be contrary for its own sake. I, I think I want to be contrary very often because I think there's so much, pardon the expression, bullshit around that, that I just find things that I want to fight because I think they're just wrong. And, and that doesn't make me a contrarian, even though everybody else thinks they're right. So. Well, actually, I, know, I, was just, I was just about to, to point out that uh, when, it, when it comes to the issues of MBAs, that to use an American expression, you certainly put your money where your mouth is. I mean, you you practiced what you preached, yeah. and one of the things that you did was to pull together a team, Jonathan Gosling, Lancaster University, UK, Hiro Itami, Hitsu, Buashi University, Tokyo, Roger Bennett McGill, Heinz Steinheiser, INSEAD, and then you reached out to the Indian Institute of Management in Bangalore. Spring of 1996, you and your team launched the International uh, Practicing management, uh, which is still in operation today. International uh, Masters in Practicing Management. Yeah, yeah. Uh, IMPM. Um, so, can you talk a little bit about the formation of the IMPM? What 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 happened? How did you get from an idea to a program? Um, we and Dora Cooper, somebody to speak to about that, because she was there at the very, very first meeting. Dora Cooper. Coop, Coop K O O P. Coop. Okay. She's here. I don't know. If, I don't know if she's in today, but you could chat with her because she, um, she was there and still there, still running the uh, McGill side of the IMPM and and and, and co-running the whole thing. Um, she was there right from the beginning. Um, I was going around bad mouthing MBA programs and. People were asking a question that is a absolutely not fair to ask an academic, which is, what are you doing about it? And I kind of like, <laughs> I'm not supposed to do anything about anything, I'm just supposed to complain. So Well, you'd already given up half your salary, so I mean, it's not like you, did, you didn't do anything. Right? Yeah, that yeah. happened, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that, the timing, yeah, the timing mm -hmm. was sort of, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, because I was 85, and uh, it was 96 when we started. This happened ar around 1994. Uh, we I thought, okay, maybe we should do something about this. So we had some initial meetings. Roger Bennett was more concerned with creating an international kind of program. I was more concerned with creating a learning from experience program. Um, so we sort of combined those. Um, I was uh, part-time at INSEAD when this was going on. Mm -hmm. So I thought I'll, um, I'll try and partner with INSEAD, and they didn't want a partnership, they wanted an affair. Uh, and so I kind of gave up. In, in fact, it was kind of amusing because I had um, tried to convince INSEAD to join the Guild to do this, and I wasn't getting anywhere. And so I wrote this long email, long, not email, but this long letter, sort of throwing in the towel. And a, a dear friend who's a bit of an unusual guy, and he, we were using the same secretary, and I'd handwritten it, and he was just reading. He, he's not a mm. snoopy guy or anything. He was just reading it because it was sitting on her desk. And he said, Henry, you can't do that. And I, he said, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't give up on that. So I realized that INSEAD would have been, was perfectly happy to have an affair with a bunch of other schools. So I called Jonathan, who I'd met, Gosling and and I said, well, what do you think about joining a partnership with this? And he said, I'll call you back in an hour, and he did. Uh, and then we, uh, I wrote to Hiro Tami, who was a friend in Japan, not realizing he was running the biggest business school, the most prestigious. He, he, he was the dean, right? I didn't know that oh. <laughs> at that point. I just he was just a friend, okay. right? he was a colleague. Um, and so I wrote to him and I said, sit down before you read this and he wrote back a day later and said why not <laughs> and and then we brought in the the so that was four schools and then we brought in the IAMB as actually Roger Bennett went to visit the IMB as a, a good possibility for the partnership and when he left they said to themselves well that was interesting we'll never see him again <laughs> <laughs> And little did they know. Little did they know. So, so we set it up, and uh, and then started problem solving. I mean, just to show you where I was at, uh, Nancy Bedor. I don't know if you ever came across Nancy. She set up the uh, the executive training development program at Ford, yeah, and was really good. And I'd gotten to know Nancy, and she was kind of advising me, and I was running things past her. And one day on the phone, she said, "So how are you going to sit them, Henry?" And I said, I guess in one of these U-shaped classrooms. And she said, not those obstetric stirrups. And <laughs> <laughs> sort of created an image. So that's how we ended up with the round tables. And, uh -huh. um, and that was critical, because if we had put them in U-shaped classrooms, so we were just learning as we went along. So what's the difference in your program between a round table and the obstetric stirrups? <laughs> well, be, because you, you lock the students into a... Uh, a non-collegial, non-collaborative uh, physical situation. I mean, Harvard talks about their U-shaped classrooms as being collaborative. They're not collaborative. Uh, they're simply, they, they give the power of individuals to talk to each other, mm -hmm. but there's nothing collaborative about the physical setup. Whereas we can go in and out of workshops in a moment's notice. I mean, my favorite story, one of my favorite stories was another Japanese guy named Tomo Noto who was at INSEAD after we had started and a few years and one day he said Henry I'd like to see the thing in operation so I said well come to the first class we're, we're, we're having a first meeting in uh, Lancaster in a few days why don't you come so he came and he sat in on the class and Jonathan was the head of the whole program at that point and, and Jonathan gave a little 10 minute introduction and then said, are there any questions? And everybody was kind of shy. And there were a lot of foreigners, you know, a lot of Japanese and Koreans and all. And so, so nobody put up their hands. So Jonathan said to talk for a few more minutes. And then he said, are there any table questions? And suddenly there was a buzz in the room. And Tomo comes up to me with this gleam in his eye. And he says, I see what you mean. And, and it just took 20 minutes for him to realize how that pedagogy was different. What's a table question? A table question was, do you have any common questions around your table? Discuss, instead of the first hand going up. Talk to each other. Talk to each other and come up with questions. And immediately there was a buzz in the room. 
And Tomo said, I see what you mean. In other words, it, it, he had to see it, but once he saw it, he realized it was completely different. So th that's actually... Anybody who's walked into this classroom is amazed at kind of what's going on there. I want to get you to describe this in a minute, but I want to follow we, up we on had something. A, we had a, a, a woman who came in because she was involved with a, in the healthcare version, she was involved with some activity in a local healthcare mm -hmm. region, and so she came in to sort of discuss with the class what they were doing. She ended up doing the program, and I said, anybody who visits this class ends up taking the program, because they mm -hmm. all see what's going on and say, I've got to be here. I, I, mean, I want to get you to describe that, but I, I want to follow up on something you said, and this may get me into trouble, but you said NC had wanted to have an affair and not a relationship. Well, <laughs> I'll bite with the difference. <laughs> what, were, what were you driving at when you they, said that? They, they, <laughs> they didn't want to have a two-school kind of marriage. Uh, they want to have something a little more casual with five schools. Oh, okay, all right, I understand. Okay. Um, so... How did the IMPM program that you created correct the problems that you saw in other MBA programs? What's different about what you're doing? Well, first of all, you don't come in unless you're a manager, mm -hmm. which would be true of a lot of EMBA programs. But second of all, we build on their managerial experience. The whole thing is predicated on them sharing their experience with each other and gaining insights into their own experience. Wharton, in its EMBA program for years, has has advertised um, you get in Wharton EMBA what you get in the Wharton regular MBA. And I'm saying this is astounding. They are boasting that they could do no more for people with 10 or 15 years of experience, some of it managerial, than they do with kids who have never managed a thing in their lives. And they're boasting about this. They're boasting about it. You bring in people with experience, you're not tapping into it. I mean, they probably do more than they admit in that comment, but... So, is part of the secret of what you're doing... And by the way, another quote from uh, that Harvard was running recently in The Economist, where this woman says, says um, this isn't theory. What does she say? This isn't theory, this is experience. We do four cases a day. And, and I'm saying, this is kind of laughable. This isn't experience, this is laughable. Uh, four cases a day is experience. Our experience is the stuff you're living with day in and day out for years in your job. That's what we call experience, not four cases a day. So, but I mean, as an instructor in that program, is the trick to draw people out and get them to to bring their experience to the table? The trick is to say go. Go. <laughs> We don't need to draw them out. We don't need to draw them out at all. All right. We just say go. Mm -hmm. Like uh, I'm mean, being overstated, but but there's no need to draw them out. The first thing on their minds is what they live with all the time. The stuff they're struggling with, the things they've experienced, the things they live with, the things they want to change. But there must be more to it That's than just sitting people in a circle and saying no. No, no, no. I mean, we don't just say go. <laughs> no, we drop in our pearls of wisdom, and you know, which gives them conceptual frameworks to deal with it. We. Uh, we do all kinds of exercises, we do, but we have a 50-50 rule that says over to them for half the time on their agendas. So the key is not what we want to do is, can you do anything with this? I'll give some lectures about emergent compared with deliberate strategy. Mm -hmm. And we'll say, can you do something with this in, in what you're doing in your own company or your own organization with this? And and they discuss it and, and, uh, and they grab the initiative like you wouldn't believe. I mean, I'll give you my favorite, one of my favorite stories is um, a woman came into our healthcare program. She wasn't a manager. She had been president of Doctors Without Borders Canada, but she wasn't a manager at that point. She was a, um, a uh, emergency room physician in a children's hospital. And during the program, she just built up much more sort of confidence about what she was capable of doing and she decided that maybe she would run for the presidency of Doctors Without Borders worldwide. And three or four of her classmates formed her campaign committee. And she now lives in Geneva and is president of Doctors Without Borders oh. worldwide. Okay, uh, so they don't need a lot of encouragement. <laughs> I mean, the, we just need to sort of give them that feeling of what they're capable of. So given 
what you developed was quite a bit different from your competition. How did you persuade companies to send their managers to you? Well, well, I assume this isn't cheap. That somebody has to pay to be here and pay to live here and yeah. pay tuition. And yeah. Uh, yeah. And that hasn't been easy, honestly, especially in this environment. It's been easier with Asian companies uh, and Europeans, some European companies like Lufthansa or LG, uh, than it's been with Western although uh, Lufthansa is Western, but uh, British or American or even Canadian companies. We've, we've had some sending groups, but uh, Boeing is we're listed in Boeing, but they don't send groups, they just make it, it's on their list of acceptable programs and so on. Um, but that hasn't been easy in this environment where, uh, because you know, people usually come to MBA programs paying themselves in order to get a better job, and usually getting a better job means in finance mm -hmm. uh, or consulting. Uh, so it had th th that aspect uh, hasn't been uh, altogether easy. In your 2004 book, Managers Not MBAs, you wrote about the IMPM program, and one of the things that you wrote really jumped out at me. You said, it continues to be the delight of my professional life, as you notice from my enthusiasm in chapters 10 through 14. Now, I know but you wrote it in four chapters in your book. But can you summarize why the IMPM continues to be the delight of your professional life? Yeah, and the IMHL even more so. The, 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 the leadership. Okay. Uh, health. Yeah, health leadership. Yeah. Um, th there's an energy in the class which is quite remarkable. Um, there's just an energy because they're so engaged and so involved. They're not, they're not just sitting here and sort of being fed our stuff or being fed our cases. You know, they're being fed half the time stuff we develop but yeah c'est moi yeah dora wants to talk to you if Who? you have a more dora yeah she's here oh dora's stop. here um Do you want me to oh. pause and yeah you can oh sorry pause. phil my okay this should be recording it's starting over right eh? Yeah, this one will start over, but this is just my backup. Here oh, I go. see. It's recording there? This oh, it's is, recording this here. This is the primary. Oh, I see. And because okay. I'm recording digitally, yeah, yeah. if anything happens, it's just gone. This is the safety net okay. right here. Okay. But we are... Yeah, we're recording there. Okay. So, um, we were talking about the IMPM. Um, I had asked you to comment on a, a quote that you wrote in uh, Managers Not MBAs, in which you said, it continues to be the delight of my professional life. And I think, I'm not sure if you finished that up or not. I mean, Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I just said the energy in the class, the ideas, the bubbling up, the, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, and uh, we should almost be paid. We, we learn as much as they learn. Do you think that's a part of good teaching? That the teacher learns yeah, as, yeah, as much as the students well, do. Well, it's the part of interesting pedagogy. Yeah. No, I mean you can give a great lecture and people learn, mm -hmm. and you don't learn anything necessarily by giving a great lecture. Mm -hmm. But this is different because you're getting the feedback on how they're dealing with your ideas, mm -hmm. uh, what they're concerned with, what's on their minds. It's it's very powerful. And as I say in the in the IMHL, the health leadership version. Mm -hmm. People come to a business. Did you want to talk more about the IMPM? Or? Um, I, I wanted to ask you one more question, okay. and then I do want to talk about the health leadership. Yeah, but again, it's you know just sort of sorting this out. Um, you wrote in Managers Not MBAs. You, you singled out one of your collaborators, Jonathan. I'm going to close this. So okay. We don't well, let me close the other one. Quarter noise. I have to close um, the other one first. That'll no, actually pop that. No, that'll do the trick. I just didn't want to pick up the corridor noise. So y you singled out one of your collaborators, Jonathan Gosling, for his contributions to creating the IMPM, and you said perhaps people associate the IMPM with me because my name is better known in the literature, but there would have been no IMPM without Jonathan. Mm -hmm. How come? What? What? A lot of the ideas mm -hmm. came from Jonathan. All these seating, we, we use all these weird and wonderful seating arrangements. I'd talk about those rolling in and rolling out. Well, you mentioned putting people in a circle and questions from the table, but that's... Well, we do, for example, one set of things we do um, is um, we have what we call eavesdropping, where, where there'll be a group meeting, they'll, they'll have a group discussion, and one person will have their back to the group, um, just listening, not mm -hmm. commenting. Sometimes we'll take those people 
and put them in the middle. This is a combination of three seating arrangements. Mm -hmm. So one is eavesdropping, one is a uh, fishbowl where we take, uh, where we have some subset of the class having a discussion among themselves with everybody else listening. It doesn't have to be, but sometimes it's the eavesdroppers who sit and they'll talk about what they're doing, what they heard. Um, and then we have a third thing, is all from Jonathan, called Rolling In and Rolling Out, where after the people in the center have had their say, anybody who wants to add to the conversation can't do it from the outside, but simply tap someone on the shoulder and replace them on the inside. So it's a running commentary. So the, the eavesdropper sits with their back to the group that's in a circle talking, and then when the discussion is over, they come into the circle and report on what they think they heard? Yeah, this is a combination of three separate seating arrangements. Okay. One is eavesdropping, which could be just by itself. Mm -hmm. One is sort of fishbowl, where a subset of the class is discussing among themselves and everybody else is listening. And, and it could be that, that it's made up of the eavesdroppers. It doesn't mean it has to be. It could be just a discussion about something that a few people in the class are knowledgeable about and they're conversing, everybody else is learning from them. And the third is, is people want to contribute to that eavesdropping discussion, replace. So if there's five chairs, there's only five mm -hmm. chairs. We, we once had a guy who wrote an article about the program in the New York Times. He was with the Herald Tribune, well, with the New York Times in effect. And, and we, we had him sitting in the middle uh, as part of this conversation, nobody wanted to replace him, so <laughs> <laughs> so everybody was coming and going except him. Um, we once had well, it's a complicated long story, but I don't know. You want long stories or this is um, we had a guy here um, who who was doing some work on uh, downsizing and and dealing with with retrenchment, mm -hmm. um, and he was doing a session with the class on retrenchment. And um, uh, so he polled the class ahead of time as to who had, this was in the EMBA, mm -hmm. but it's the same design. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a McGill, I should say, uh, McGill University of Montreal Business School joint program, right. but it's designed after the IMPM. You actually saw the flyer for it out front in the yeah. street. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a, a similar philosophy. And so he polled the class ahead of time as to who had experience with retrenchment, and some did and some didn't, and, and he also asked negative or positive. So there were positive, negative, and no, no experience. And then he decided that he would use another seating arrangement we call clamshell, where two groups uh, sort of debate and discuss among themselves. But, but he tried to do it with the whole class. That was a class of 40. You're not going to get 20 people mm -hmm. facing each other. So we realized that didn't make much sense. So we were sort of scratching our heads while they're busy moving around. And we said, okay, so let's seat them by their experience. So we, we seated them with three or four tables of people with positive experience, three or four tables of people with negative experience to discuss some of their experience. But then we realized, what are we going to do with the people with no experience? doesn't make sense that, that they're going to talk to each other about something they don't know. So we said, well, let's use those as eavesdroppers. Okay, so they all sat as eavesdroppers. And then... We brought them into the center, and all the people with experience were listening to what all the people without experience were reacting to the conversation. Huh. And they loved this. Some of them said, the ones on the outside, somebody said, we, they said, I never learned so much about, about retrenchment as I learned from listening to their point of view because these are experienced managers who just didn't have experience and one of the people inside said we i learned more about retrenchment than anybody in this room in this session hmm. so that's an example and a lot of this comes from jonathan not the specific retrenchment exam but but a lot of these mechanisms come from john's jonathan and you're about to celebrate the 20th anniversary of yeah, this program it's so May, yeah. it's persisted um I want to ask you a question, actually, about your dissertation, and then I want to to, to ask you about the, the health. Um, let's see here. Okay, so you defended your dissertation in 1968, mm -hmm. and then according to what I've read, you sent it out unrevised, <laughs> uh, and that didn't do so well. You got a bunch of rejections. 
copy of this somewhere. Yeah. And then faced with those rejections, and I assume you must have talked to people, you revised it, sent it out again, and you got several more rejections before what I said, Random House finally picked I, it up. I got one after the other rejections. Uh, you know, the committee took a while in deliberations, and I thought, what's going on? They told me it was a sure thing, and they said, oh, we're just discussing publishing possibilities. So I thought, oh, well, if they're discussing publishing possibilities, and I'll just drop it in the mail, and you can send the checks to the following address. You, you remember Snoopy? With the, he, he would be sitting on the doghouse saying, a letter from my publisher, it must be a check. They were all rejection. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, so um, I just got turned And then I said to my wife at that point, I said, I know this is going to be successful. I don't care what they all said. I'm going to re rewrite it. And uh, and I completely revised I was planning to revise it anyway. I didn't think they'd publish the thesis. Mm -hmm. I said I'm going to revise it. But, um, so I completely rewrote it and sent it out again. And they all kept turning it down. Except that that time, I initially I sent it out sequentially. It was my preferred publisher. And then when I got in, a, in, in the second case, I just sent it to them all at once. So there was this wonderful guy at Harper's who loved it and immediately accepted it. And, and then I got a second offer from Random House. So I'm, I'm wondering what you learned from all that rejection. Did that have any impact on your development as a scholar? No, it, it could have been exactly the opposite. I could have gone into a shell and that was it. Well, you didn't, though. That I was did, <laughs> no, I had a kind of thick skin and I just said, screw them, they're wrong. <laughs> I've done that ever since. Well, I, I don't. I, if I know I'm right, I don't care. So, I mean, is that your general approach to to scholarship? Is it? Yeah. I mean, that you, I, I'm not going to say screw them. I'm right, but I mean that that you have enough confidence in your own ideas to to, to move ahead even when it's not in the mainstream. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I never would have gotten anywhere with anything. I, I I'll tell you about. I don't know if you came across this, but it's my favorite sort of anecdote about myself. Where, uh, did I tell you about being interviewed at Heathrow and uh, uh, no, no, I did that. It's didn't. probably my favorite. In fact, I th th it's what belongs on my tombstone, I think. But uh, I, I was, um, you know, dear love, and uh, these two guys in London who do these polls of gurus these days. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So we we're trying to find a time to interview me, and uh, we couldn't find one. So. I said, oh, look, I'm getting off a plane at Heathrow. Why don't you, maybe I was changing planes or something. Why don't you interview me then? So 7.30 in the morning, I'm completely jet lagged, and he's interviewing me. And at one point he says, so this guru business, how, you know, how do you deal with it? It must be very competitive. And I blurted this out, and it sounds incredibly uh, arrogant, but it's not at all, I don't think. I said, I never set out to be the best. It's too low a standard. I set out to be good, and, and and that's what belongs on my tombstone, I think, in a way, mm -hmm. which is, I wasn't saying that everybody else is doing junk, I was basically saying you compete with yourself. You, you, you try and do as best as you can do in terms of your own skills, and mm -hmm. you're not going to get anywhere uh, by, by trying to be better than somebody else, you're going to get somewhere by doing as well as you can possibly do. And my, my greatest competitor is myself. And if you see drafts, the pamphlet went through 15 drafts. If you see those drafts, you could ask Santa about this. If you see, they're scribbled from one end to mm -hmm. the other. Everything has changed 15 times. I mean, usually in my simply, my managing book was about five times in each mm -hmm. chapter. But this was 15 times and dramatically shifted. If you look at the... Uh, book version. I could send it to you now because mm -hmm. I just sent it to the publisher. If you look at the book version compared to the pamphlet version mm -hmm. on the website, it's the same idea, but a lot of revising and shifting and clarifying and so on. So so I'm I'm always competing with myself in a way. And and if I think that I've got something good and other people don't think it's good, that's their problem. <laughs> So and, you see your and, own, and and the fact that I so viciously edit my own stuff means I'm not enamored with it because I wrote it down. 
I just read it and it doesn't sound. I can read 50 pages of, of something I've written. This is what kept happening in the pamphlet. I would read it over and it would be perfectly smooth and then I'd come to a section and it kind of like, how did I ever write this? I just stopped that and rewrite it. And then if I put in a new section, then inevitably it's got to go through three right. four times. So there were always sections where I was doing major rewrites. But do you think that the, the key to successful writing is to revise and revise until you feel as though you've gotten it right? For me. Yeah. I, I remember, I have a friend who did a good book, and in those days he hand wrote it, and he hand wrote it so neatly that I thought, why is he bothering to get it printed? Just publish it handwritten. <laughs> just, <laughs> and it, it, you know, it's like Beatrice Potter or something. You know, <laughs> the original stories of Rab Peter Rabbit or whatever. You know, they're all handwritten. But, but um, uh, I remember reading about some famous poet poem that was rewritten ninety three times, and there are other poets who just write it down. Mm -hmm. So I'm the former. I have to go through draft after draft after draft. I can't say that's good for everybody. It depends what. I am concerned with the computer now because it's very hard to integrate. You see, the key to writing, do you ever see the piece, you must have seen it, eh? the developing theory about yeah, the developing yeah, yeah. theory. The, the key to writing, or the hardest part about writing, is that you're writing about something that's non-linear, but you've got to get it in linear because a book or an article is first word, last word, every word in between. It's totally linear. a beginning linear. and a middle and an end. And, you know. Unless you're writing a diary, there's nothing linear about what you're writing. If you're writing about managing or about you know, rebalancing society, there's nothing linear about that. So, so the key is to get it into that kind of order. And, and that's, that's the hard part of writing. When you're sitting there with a big screen and a, and a keyboard, Everything else is pushed out. Whereas when I'm integrating, I'm I've got papers all around. I'm kind of pulling and looking, mm -hmm. you know. And sometimes I'll have a big sheet of paper to do an outline, sort of. But I, but I, I I can't have a screen there or a, or a keyboard there because everything else gets relegated to second place. Um, I do a lot of editing now hmm. online, final editing. Once you have a yeah. text copy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once it's fairly well developed. So more and more. One of your recent scholarly interests has to do with healthcare, and you, if I count it right, managing the myths of healthcare 2012 is your 16th book. Um, what? Uh, it's not out yet. It's, it's, it's uh, not out yet. Uh, okay, it's in press. It's not in press, meaning with the publisher? Yeah. No, it's no? been in progress for. All right, okay, my <laughs> mistake. My mistake. Yeah. All right. There's an article called Managing the Myths of Healthcare, which, which I is at, out. That's which what you saw, but that's just an okay. article. Okay. All the right. book, you know what? I need two weeks of work to get it to the publisher, and in six months, I haven't had it because of the pamphlet. See, I'm going back and forth with the pamphlet. Sometime in the next month, I'll finish it. Now, I will say that, 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 that what you referred to as a pamphlet, when I looked at it online, I think it was 130 pages. Yeah. I know. So I don't want people to get the idea that we're talking a threefold here or anything. Yeah. This is the, that pamphlet is a rather lengthy manuscript, just the online version. Yeah, yeah. So. No, I'm thinking it's going to be a bit shorter in the book, but I'm calling it a book, uh, the actual thing. Yeah, I mean, t uh, Common Sense was about 60 pages, I think. Tom Paine. Oh, yeah, Tom, that Common Sense, yes. It was, I don't know about exactly, but it was not a very long book. No, it was a pamphlet. Yeah. Um, so, from 2006 to 2009, you were the faculty director of the International Masters for Health Leadership. Um, what need do you think that that program filled? Oh, that program is actually doing very well um, because it combines the pedagogy of the IMPM with addressing healthcare in general. So it's not about hospitals. It's not about US or Canada. It's a, it's worldwide for people from all aspects of healthcare. Mm -hmm. And it's about uh, we call it a forum for addressing the major issues of healthcare. And I was saying before that in business people come to a program 
to develop themselves and maybe their companies, but in healthcare, at least in our class, we're getting all kinds of people who are there for the sake of healthcare worldwide. We have a woman in the executive director, uh, as office of the uh, of the um, WHO, for example, in the World Health class. Organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and so on and so forth. So, so there's an amazing energy, amazing, even better than the IMPM. Did that surprise you? Did you did you, did you see that coming? Not to this degree. Mm -hmm. I mean. My experience is that it always, these are always very energetic. The EMBA, same thing, always the very energetic. The executive ma management program? The EMBA. executive MBA that, that yeah. between Miguel and Ashisei that mirrors, Ashisei is called Les Hautitudes Commerciales, which is the University of Montreal French. Mm -hmm. And we do it jointly. It's a bilingual program and uh, and uh, it's modeled after the IMPM. Mm -hmm. Same Easy. energy. Um, what attracted you to healthcare as a field of study? I mean, of all the things you could have picked, what, why did you say? Because on it's healthcare? probably the one that's most problematic now in terms of management. Uh, maybe as you get older, you get more aware of health issues. Uh, but I've always dabbled. I mean, uh, and dabbled isn't quite the right word, but I've always, you know, my very first study included mm -hmm. the executive director of the Mass General Hospital. Right. That was your dissertation that you're talking about, yeah. Mm. You're also, from 2007 to the present, served as a founding partner of CoachingOurselves.com, yeah. um, which, as I understand, is a private company that you co-own with uh, Phil Lanier. Yeah. Um, what, what is the purpose of Coaching Ourselves? It's the same com? philosophy as the IMPM, mm -hmm. which is built on experience and so on. It just gets rid of the professor as a presence professor comes in through what kind of look like extended PowerPoints. So, so companies sign up and they buy topics and they form groups and the groups download topics which could be things like uh, things like uh, silos and slabs and organizations or you know aspects of innovation or we have one called it does have an off button you know, how to deal with the technology and so on and so forth. And they, so the professor comes in in printed form and they discuss among themselves for about 90 minutes these different topics and ask themselves questions about how can we carry it forward. So it's very much like a lecture and workshop in our classes, except the groups are doing it all by themselves. And it's all basically online. No, well, it comes online, but yeah. they work on hard copy. Mm -hmm. We don't want them to work with uh, with electronic copy, so they work in, they work on sheets. Okay. So I want to ask you just a few general questions, and we'll wrap it up. And um, as you reflect on your, your long career, which, which is not over by any means, um, is there anything that you would do over or do differently? <laughs> I wouldn't even dream of knowing how to answer that question okay. because I, I, you know, I, I thought if I write a, an autobiography, it would be called Dreams I Never Could Have Dreamt, um, because I mean I, I was ambitious and I, you know, had lofty goals and all that, but I never, ever, ever could have dreamt of what I would have ended up doing and how I would have ended up and success and my absolute delight. I, 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 I get to be creative every day, every day in some way or other. I mean, whether we're creating our MOOC right now, mm -hmm. whether I'm writing a topic for coaching ourselves, uh, all the meetings we've been having, you know, in the IMHL, attending class in the IMHL, the IMPM, I, I wouldn't even know where to begin to say either how it could have been better, that I can't even imagine, and, and totally suited to me because I, you know, I remember once my father saw an ad in the paper for a dean, a new dean of our faculty at McGill, and he says, do you think I'll get it? He says, do you think you'll get it? <laughs> Never in the world would I want that. So you grew up here in Montreal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're looking out your window at Mont Royal, yeah. but uh, yeah. but somewhere around here, young Henry Mitzberg must have been running around and growing up and so just, on. Just on the other side. Uh, 
Did you ever in your wildest dreams when you were a young boy or young man, teenager, think that your life would end up the way it did? No. No, no I was in no danger of being chosen as the most likely to succeed. <laughs> That's a lovely turn of phrase, sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, I was okay in high school. Yeah. But I wasn't. I was surrounded by a bunch of smart guys. We have like a province-wide competition. Mm -hmm. uh, who comes first in the province and all that. And I, I was surrounded by first, second, fourths in my class. But I, I was okay. Yeah. I was okay. And in engineering school, I was okay. I don't know why MIT let me in. It was a mistake. Um, into the master's program um, and I think maybe the only reason they let me into the doctoral program is because I was writing all these nasty things in the student letter about how they had to revise the whole program <laughs> and uh, I think I came to their attention and my teeth sort of very open mm -hmm. so they mistakenly let me in and then, and then I started to shine. Mm -hmm. it's in the, it was in the PhD program that I became a real, stu real scholar. In terms of the body of your scholarship, which is vast. What what do you consider to be your most important contribution? Well, that's a, a bit difficult. But what I consider to be my favorite piece is structuring of organizations or structuring of fives. It is so integrated and so tight mm -hmm. from beginning to end. I have somewhere here. God knows, it's in this office somewhere. I don't know where. By the way, this is no, that's not. Um, I don't know. It's here somewhere. Uh, oh, here. Maybe it's here. No, I don't know where it is. A two hundred and fifty-page outline of that book. Huh. All I had to do was kind of fill in the verbs. <laughs> so I was going to say, I use outlines, but I have never written a 250-page outline. I never did it before, I never did it since. But it worked. And, and it, uh, somebody once said, we heard you wrote that book in three months. It's 512 very dense yeah. pages. And I did, I wrote it in three months. But that was the first draft. But, but the outline took a hell of a lot of time. And once I had the outline, I had the book. So once you wrote the outline, then you wrote the book. and. In, in three months, months but yeah. then I had to revise it yeah. for several months after and add quotes and all that stuff. But but in terms of my most significant work, uh, my hope is that the pamphlet or the uh, rebalancing mm -hmm. by far, by far, because it's the most ambitious thing I've tried and it's the one that could have the most impact. I would say of the other things I've done, the main things like strategy, organization, managerial work, um, e all equally kind of important for me in the sense that in each case I tried to rethink sort of what strategy is, what managing is, how we understand organizations. But re rebalancing, no question. If, if my, my hope is, it's too soon obviously to say that, but my hope is that it'll have the most impact. So when you look at your own career, where you are right now, do you consider yourself a work in progress? Yeah, in some ways, yeah, I mean, I, it's hard to say yes, because, I mean, I've done a lot of the things I want to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I would think if you spoke to someone like Leslie Brightner, I don't know, did I give you her name? Um, she could tell you about our group, our group meeting, our group meetings. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we just laugh a lot, and the ideas are coming hot and heavy, and I haven't slowed down at all in terms of, I think my thoughts and my uh, my capabilities. I what I'm hoping now is that I'll turn more. I've written an awful lot of personal stuff, mm -hmm. and I'd like to see some of that published. A whole bunch of short stories. They, they're on my website. Mm -hmm. I mean, did you yeah. see um, that kind of thing? And you know, I'd like to see some of that get into print. So, if I ask you, what would you still like to accomplish? You've got what you're calling your pamphlet, which is a book. Um, personal stories and things that are unpublished but on your website? And well, there's, yeah, there's the pamphlet and, and the consequence of the pamphlet because there's questions in there, like the Irene question I mentioned yeah. earlier, kind of what can I do about this and how do you, because people are saying, okay, you've described it all, now what? I'd like to give some attention to that. I obviously want to get the healthcare book out, but that's pretty much done. Um, 
and then my personal writing, not only short stories, I've got, I wrote a book, I got on a bicycle in France in 1987, and I bicycled alone across France for 800 kilometers, and I wrote a book about my life, about France, about experiences and so on, wrapped it all up, put it in the vault, and it remains unread to this day. Still in the vault. And I'd like to do something with that eventually. Um, what do you what do you consider your legacy to be or what would you like your legacy to be? Now you joked a little bit earlier about what you'd like to be on your tombstone, but I mean a little broader than that. I mean to bring some sanity to a crazy world. <laughs> Is that a common goal for a scholar? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Final question. Um, is there anything that I should have asked you that I didn't? Or anything that you'd like to say that I can give you a chance to say? You know, you did such a good job and you asked so many wonderful questions and I learned so much from the questions you're asking. But I would hesitate to answer that even if I did have an answer. Well, um, we'll go for it. <laughs> but I, um, I have to think about it. Um, no, I think you've covered a lot of ground. You know, it's a bit like the other question about, you know, uh, you know uh, sort of what I hoped for versus what I accomplished. And I kind of said I wouldn't even know how to begin answering that question. I think it's the same with this question. Mm -hmm. In the sense that the world sort of unfolds in ways that yeah. you can't possibly predict. So even to say, um, you know, I wish it would, would have been this, or I wish it would have been that, mm -hmm. there's so many possibilities and so many options and so many things that could have happened mm -hmm. that I couldn't even dream of. You know, I sort of like to think there's two kinds of creativity. There's what I call spontaneous creativity, which is Picasso doing Guernica or something, uh, or I wouldn't call this spontaneous necessarily, but Tchaikovsky writing the Violin Concerto, which is my favorite piece of music. And this is creativity that I can't even fathom. I just, I can't imagine how he could have come up with those notes in that way. And I just, it's amazing to me. And then there's the other kind of creativity, which is fairly banal, but probably does more to change the world than anything else. And I'm thinking, for example, of Fleming with the mold in the bacteria. And what did he do? He just said, wait a minute, if the mold is killing it, the bacteria, then maybe we can use that in the body. It's sort of, yeah, good idea. And we got penicillin. <laughs> and we got penicillin and antibiotics. And, yeah. and, and it's kind of like, yeah, that's a very good idea. <laughs> it changed the world. Mm -hmm. But is it like Guernica or like Tchaikovsky's Violin Concerto? No, it's just, you know, um, it's this little switch. And and I think I, I'm awful at the first kind, I think. I, when we play these games, like 42 ways to use a pen or something, I, I just blank. I can't. My daughter, Lisa. Mm -hmm. She's got this kind of creativity. One day she was about five, and I look in horror in the backyard, and she's got these two bugs on her hand. I say, Lisa, what's that? And she said, shh, they're having a race. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, I, I, I don't come up with stuff like that. But, but I think I have that cap capacity to switch things around and just sort of say, no, wait a minute. If it's this way, then it could be that way. Well, uh, Henry, I'm going to respect your time. We've been talking for a little bit more than two hours. And, no, that's fine, and before I turn the recorder off, I want to thank you very much on behalf of myself and the Dubai Center and the International Leadership Association for being kind enough to share time with me both today and last fall here in Montreal. Phil, it's a huge pleasure for me. Uh, I'll tell you a little anecdote in leaving. Um, Leslie Breitner's husband, John Breitner, who you probably didn't meet. No, I, mean, I talked to Leslie on the phone. Yeah. yeah. So John is a physician, a researcher in Alzheimer's. Uh, McGill, but he's an American. They just moved here about five years mm -hmm. ago. And John calls himself kind of moderate conservative. 
and um, and John said um, um, uh, when he looked at the pamphlet I asked him to give me comments on the pamphlet because of his political perspective and so on and I thought I'd get good com comments and I got superb comments um, but what I didn't expect is how enthusiastic he was about the pamphlet uh, I, I sort of call this the John question, which is how do I get people like John, who would never read this, to read it other than being the husband of a colleague? Mm -hmm. Because if they read it, it really could get somewhere. But John wrote me an email recently, a few weeks ago. I put it in the new version. And, and he said, Henry, if you want to reach the Johns of this world, recognize the good folks of America and and uh, the generous kind he said more generous than canadians which is true we're not we're not sort of big philanthropists the way americans tend to be i don't mean rich philanthropists i mean just ge <coughs> donations and and he said you got to um speak to the good folks of america and i really took that to heart and i edited through the whole thing from beginning to end i did a search on every use of the word american u.s mm -hmm. everything and really tried to change the tone because I you probably being American you might have picked up the tone Canadians are always critical of Americans anyway but but um, I have spent an awful lot of time working in Canada and I just understand, used to I understand that perspective you're so. used to it <laughs> anyway 